somebody to uh, realize they're an insider in the universe. Most people seem to prefer outsider status, which is not a good, not a good place to be, because um, it's not really a tenable position. It's not, uh, although people might want to want to uh, believe that they're outsiders of the universe. They're outside the universe. They're actually. The universe doesn't take the same view of them that they take of the universe. <laughs> and unfortunately, if you look at the history of mankind, you see that cultures, many cultures have found out that, that uh, discrepancy, uh, the discrepancy between the, uh, the false belief that one or one's culture exists outside uh, the universe versus the... Um, uh, harsh realization as people are starting to come to the realization uh, in our culture today that uh, the universe took a diff takes a different view of that their status than they thought they were taking. So given the fact that uh, we are all insiders to the universe, the question is how do we actually see the universe from the inside? And this is really uh, the subject what really is the subject of physical science. Physical science is the effort to see the universe from the inside. Now, and it's very paradoxical, right? Because on the one hand, as Lynn points out, the universe is finite. There is nothing outside the universe. There's no part of, there's, not, there's no other universes, there's no alternative universes, and uh, Universal physical principles, universal principles exist everywhere in the universe. They're as big as the whole universe. But since there's nothing, there's not, there's not, there's the, uh, and, and this leads to the idea that that Einstein and Riemann had of a finite uh, but unbounded universe, which Lynn has corrected to the idea of a finite but self-bounded universe. And um, so, but the, the question is, the question for science is, how do you actually see the universe as a whole from being inside a small part of it? How do you see, how do we actually know a universal physical principle? If the universal physical principle is as big as the universe, and since we're obviously not as big as the universe, we're small compared to the extent of the universe. How do we actually see the whole universe from being inside a small part of it? And this uh, effort uh, begins as um, uh, uh, all modern science does with the Greek, Pythagorean, and Egyptian concept of the idea of spherics. And this is what spherics really, really is. But the, the effort to really master this um, view uh, begins really for the first time in uh, really, or I shouldn't say begins for the first time, but takes takes a a, uh, uh, a new step forward uh, with uh, Riemann's 1854 habilitation paper, which was given on June 10th, 1854, um, and. Uh, 
And in that paper, basically, that Riemann, in that lecture, Riemann uh, spelled out, in, in effect, an insider's view of the universe. So the best way to to get a handle on this question is to use that uh, Riemann um, work, his lecture, as a guide, uh, and uh, to really looking at how mankind has tried to deal with this question for uh, the last uh, 3,000 years. And this is obviously very crucial today because what um, uh, if you, for the job, that uh, the task that's in front of us, what, what we're called upon to do from the standpoint of what history is demanding of us right now is the ability to actually uh, uh, see the universe as a whole from inside of it. This is what's required. It's not, as I thought that Aunt Lynn's answer to the last question, mm -hmm. uh, the webcast, was uh, was uh, quite indicative of that, right? Uh, yes, we have to we have to uh, solve certain practical, immediate problems that face mankind. But like like uh, uh, Plato uh, said to the Delians, right? It's not the practical problems that you have to solve. You can't solve the practical problems unless your mind is in the right place, unless your mind is capable of actually looking at what universe these you're actually in, what universe these, problem, uh, uh, these problems are actually occurring in. Now, the problem we have, of course, is that most of the people we talk to, as, as um, um, you, you know from your own experience, uh, most of the people take a different approach. They, don't, they take a much different view. Uh, they, they prefer a conception of the universe in which they, they imagine that they are outside the process, that they're outside what's going on in the universe, and therefore they can uh, pick and choose uh, what they choose to believe or not choose to believe, or how they, uh, th that these things are, that these, some, some of these choices are, are somehow uh, optional and arbitrary. And that really is a result of the kind of education they've had, as Lynn has emphasized uh, over and over again, uh, that it's the acceptance of the, the, the uh, acceptance of the kind of things such as Euclidean geometry that cause people to, or begin the indoctrination that most people have, uh, that to 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 look at themselves as if they were not insiders to the universe. They and and they don't say that, right? If you say to somebody, obviously, you know. You believe in Euclidean geometry. Most, a lot of people won't even know what you're talking about, right? But it was the they were nevertheless introduced to the method of Euclid, to the method of of Euclidean geometry. In some cases, directly, in most cases, directly through Euclidean geometry. Although they began to, they might have sort of pulled away from that over time, uh, or. or uh, forgotten about it uh, as they as they got out of uh, uh, elementary school and junior high school, but they nevertheless became indoctrinated into that way of thinking. That is, that if you start with a set of axioms, postulates, and definitions, or what people refer to colloquially as beliefs, these are my beliefs. You hear that all the time when you're arguing, when you're trying to organize people, right? And they say, well, I what I believe is, right? And then they say what they think they believe. But what when they're stating what they think is their belief, it's not a, it's, it's, a, it's an axiom. It's something that, that flows, and it might not even be the, a fundamental axiom, because you can take somebody's belief and you can start to trace it back to the underlying axioms that... Uh, on which it's based, but they're, what they're saying is that they act, that they're beginning with the idea of an axiomatic system. That is, there are no uh, that, that 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 the things that what you know flows from uh, initially a set of axioms, postulates, and definitions. And this is, of course, the way Riemann begins his habilitation paper with an attack on precisely that question. 
in a very polemical and dramatic way by saying, for 2,000 years, from Euclid to Legendre, people have uh, been talking about geometry, and they never bothered to ask the question, is any of this true? <laughs> and, and this is a real startling statement, right? Because here, all of science is supposedly built up on this question of the geometry of, on the principles of geometry. And here's Riemann, for the first time publicly. It had been said actually a little bit publicly by, by Kessner, but Gauss never said it. And here Riemann states it dramatically in a room filled with the most prominent scientists of the time. And he said, you know, nobody's ever bothered to think of that the way we've been conducting ourselves for the last 2,000 years may not be true. So how do we actually conduct ourselves? And he says, well, the place you have to go is to um, he references uh, some discussions of Herbart on psychology and then two major, three major pieces by Gauss is what he refers to in the, in the habilitation paper. One is the uh, second treatise on biquadratic residues. The other is the uh, so-called Copenhagen Prize essay. Uh, actually, four papers, the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra and Gauss's paper on curved surfaces which are all uh, extensions and revolutionary and dramatic extensions of actually something which begins with uh, Cusa and Kepler. Uh, now, um, which is the effort to, or, or uh, Cusa's re realiza realization, uh, as he explains in most of his dialogues, including Didacta Ignorantia, that uh, you have to, how do you actually look at the universe from the inside? Kuz opposes it in, from the standpoint of the paradox of how does an individual human being whose existence is finite and temporal actually know the uh, universe as a whole, which appears, at least from the standpoint of the finite and temporal, to be eternal and um, uh, and infinite. And Kuza introduces an idea which, uh, as, um, which is not uh, uh, new to Kuza. Actually, he revived an idea, but he introduced it in a new way, in, in, an, in a certain sense an improved way, from the same idea that, that Plato had, which is that this, what, this uh, apparently infinite universe is not actually infinite. It actually has a characteristic to it, which is not the characteristic that is assumed in, uh, by, as expressed by the principles of Euclidean geometry. It is infinitely extended in three directions, back, forth, up, down, and so forth. That Kuza, actually, Kuza revised the, 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 the Socratic idea, as, as Plato talks about in the Timaeus, where he says, okay, if the universe is everything, there's nothing outside of it, and it has, therefore, it takes nothing into it from outside of it, and it, it excretes nothing out of it into something else, then what would be the form of this universe? And Plato, it, and if, it, if it's self-moving, so it's not moving in anything, it's moving uh, in it, it's moving itself, then the only characteristic that one can uh, imagine of the universe is that it has a spherical form. And this is really where the idea of the sphere comes from, is to say this concept of the sphere is the first, as, as Kepler later calls it, is the first assumption of reason of what the, the, the form of a universe which encompasses the all must be. But why is it? Why is the sphere the idea of self-moving, self-bounded, nothing excreted, nothing? Excreted. Because if it has, if it has nothing outside of it, mm -hmm. right? In other words, if the universe is, it were, were as Euclid says, infinitely extended in three directions, yeah. then, and it would be, it would be. Um, uh, 
then as you as you keep going further and further, the, your your what's the universe expanding into? It assumes this is the ironic thing. Assuming thinking that the universe is infinitely extended, assume that it can extend into something. But there's nothing outside the universe. So once you think of once you think of something which is completely self-contained and self-bounded, because the an infinitely extended uh, Euclidean type space has no boundary to it. Mm -hmm. But but if the universe is it contains everything, then it <laughs> contains itself. Why the sphere though? Well, the sphere is just the first approximation. That's mm -hmm. who, that's what the approximation Plato gets. And Plato gives the disclaimer in the beginning of the Timaeus where he <laughs> says, Okay, um, uh, look, when I'm when I'm gonna you wanna know what I think about the universe. Right? Uh, but before I uh, tell you, I'm going to have to use words and images, mm -hmm. uh, because because what we're talking about is something that is beyond words and images. So, but I'm going to I'm going to have to tell you this using words and images, and so consequently, uh, you have to beware that you don't mistake the actual words and images for the thing that the words and images are referring to, mm -hmm. right? But that's always the that's the case with all ideas. No ideas are expressed by the words. That's the Scalia idea of textual interpretation. That if you just interpret the words directly, uh, that's why you have to be very careful with people when, when in, in our culture, we're so steeped in steeped in sophistry that they always say, "Oh, put this in the following, or state it this way, or what you really mean to say is." Or, in other words, what you're saying is, and then they restate what you say in some completely different way to say. Right? Because, yeah, because they, want it because, because they want to say the idea is the words. But the ideas are not the words. The words are simply the vehicle by which an idea in one mind is recreated in the mind of another person. So Plato gives that, that distinction. Now, a more accurate concept of the idea of a self-bounded universe is Riemann's idea, a more more advanced concept than the sphere. Uh, the spherical form that Gauss uh, had is Riemann's idea of what he calls an entoply extended manifold. And an entoply extended manifold is not a spherical form, it's something that goes beyond the sphere. But what it has in common with the spherical form of the Egyptian Greek idea of spherics and Plato's idea in the Timaeus of the sphere is that it's a self-bounded, finite but self-bounded universe. And that's what um, Riemann also refers to in the debilitation paper. So Riemann puts forward this idea, I mean, uh, Plato puts forward this, this form, this idea, in his, in his, um, uh, uh, in the Timaeus, and then raises, the, and then, and then poses the question, which Kuhn's later actually resolves in a more, in a sharper way, which is, uh, on the, which is how is it then that man, who is finite and temporal, that is, our lives have a beginning and an end, and we're, we live in a, a small part of the universe as a pro in terms of our physical, uh, uh, direct physical relationship to space and to time. How is it that we can actually know how the universe as a whole works? Well, uh, what Cusa is going up against here is Aristotle and Euclid and the doctrines of Aristotle, which which took that paradox or attempted to to resolve that paradox by taking the outsider's view of the universe and says, well, you can't. That is, you have a universe which is which is uh, self-founded and eternal, and therefore you can't. You are actually outside of it. Because of the because of the apparent smallness and finiteness and temporalness of human life, 
than the universe as a whole, then that, that, that smallest thing is essentially outside this process, is, uh, is, not, is not inside the process. And if it is inside, if you, if you concede that it's inside the process, you have to also concede that you can't know the whole process. But Kusa, Kusa shows the way that this is resolved. And it's resolved, and he, and he uses many demonstrations of it, using the principle of what he calls the minimum and the maximum. Hey, yeah. what, what, what's the argument was for that? Just since it's finite. Since, since we, so Aristotle's <laughs> argument for that paradox, right, is that essentially man's mind, which is thinking about this question of the universe as a whole, is essentially outside the universe as a whole. We're not actually in it. Therefore, we can't answer that question. Yeah. He uses the fact that, that the finiteness and temporalness of human existence as distinct from the universe as a whole, he's, his, his, uh, he resolves this paradox by saying it doesn't, by, by saying man is basically, ma the man's mind, human cognition, human creative thought, is essentially outside the universe as a whole. That is, there's a universe which is governed by universal principles which are eternal. And since man is finite and temporal, we're outside that eternal process. Right? Now, Kuzi uses many metaphors to try and get people to understand this question, especially the most, the most uh, important of which is his metaphor of having to do with the quadrature of the circle, in which, which we've discussed many times, in which Kuzi uh, demonstrates that here in this simple example of the circle for the polygon, one sees how a uh, man, we can essentially, the mind is capable of comprehending as a, a, a one, a process which appears to be infinite. Because when you look at the question of the, the relationship of the uh, curve to the straight, as Kuzi called it, the circle to the polygon, that you can never dis express such a relationship in finite terms. You can only express it in infinite terms. Yet you can conceive of that infinite expression as a single idea. And this is what Kuza comes back to again and again and again. Now, I'm not going to go through all, I mean, we can, in the discussion period, just get, get more detail into Kuza. But what Kuza, this is one of the reasons why um, you can identify Kuza as the founder of modern science. Because what you get, beginning with the Doctor Ignorantia, and then Kuz's later dialogues, is a, a, a development of the method of how to actually look at the universe from the from the inside. How do you actually know the universe from the inside? Now, the first person to actually apply Kuz's method in the domain of physical science was Kepler. And this is the, the this is the this really is what Kepler is looking at in his uh, discovery of planetary motion. Now, one of this well, on one level, it's a very um, um, it expresses itself in the actual problem that Kepler is trying to solve, which is what Einstein refers to in his 1930 uh, uh, commemoration of Kepler that I wrote about in, in the um, uh, pedagogy on the 375th anniversary of Kepler's passing. And in that, Einstein refers to the problem that Kepler tried to solve, which is, how do you determine the nature of planetary motion from a planet which itself is moving according to the principles of planetary motion? Right? So, right there, you have a a physical application of the idea, physical application of the principle, how do you recognize the universe from the inside? Because we're inside the solar system. We're actually moving in the solar system. And yet we have to determine not only, we have to determine the, the motions of the planets from a planet which itself is moving. 
which is why the first thing Kepler did was to determine the motion of the Earth, not the motion of Mars. And how did he determine the motion of the Earth? He had to imagine what the motion of the Earth would look like were he on Mars. But he didn't know where Mars was. So he had to use the relative positions of the Earth, Sun, and Mars to imagine how the Earth would look from the standpoint of Mars, thus determining a precise uh, concept of the Earth's orbit, and then from that concept of the Earth's orbit, turn back and look at Mars, now knowing where he was, having never left the Earth. Okay. Wow. So from a practical standpoint, Kepler, Kepler, this this idea of discovering the universe from the inside is is uh, already expressed in the practical problem of determining planetary motion. Which is why, if you want to uh, do anything in science, you have to start with Kepler. If you want to do eco physical economic animations, as Lynn emphasizes in his new paper, if you want to study atomic physics, if you want to know anything about physics, you have to master how Kepler discovers the orbits of planetary motion. Which, of course, is one of the reasons why uh, when you want to prevent people from being able to figure out how the universe works from the inside, you uh, take Kepler's method, reduce it to three mathematical formulas, put it in a textbook, and tell people <laughs> they don't have to read Kepler, which is what modern science education is. If if there was if if, if the um, if the people running your education were not malicious, uh, you would have read Kepler's works and studied them and mastered them. <laughs> when you were in your early teens, probably in Virginia middle, middle school science education program <laughs> would be working through Kepler's new astronomy. Man, well, man. You could teach everything everything you need to know with science. It, and it should be mandatory, just like a just like choral work should be mandatory, right? You know, you'd have much better citizenry if if they at least learn two things in in um, in their uh, elementary and secondary school education. Uh, how to sing and Kepler's method for determining planetary motion. <laughs> you would have a much healthier society. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, uh, so that, but, so, but there's something also more profound in the way Kepler approached this thing of how to look, look at this from the, how to, how to discover the universe from the inside. Because Kepler, uh, was up against, as he polemicizes in the beginning of his um, uh, new astronomy, that the problem is that, the, uh, just as, as Riemann did, that there is a fundamental error in the way everybody is thinking about, about this question of how do you understand the planetary motion. And the fundamental problem was that they were looking at the question as if it could not be answered. Which is certainly a bad way to start <laughs> scientific investigation. Say, okay, I'm going to investigate planetary motion knowing that I can't answer the question. Right? Which, of course, is a really good way to, to, if you want to bullshit, because then no matter what answer you come up with, you could say, well, so what? You know, I never said this is true. <laughs> Which, of course, is the way a lot of the Congress right now is thinking about how to make policy. So, but there's something different, right? That Kepler is saying, well, wait a minute. The, what's the more fundamental question I'm really asking? The more fundamental question I'm asking is not how the planets are moving. The more fundamental question I'm asking is what kind of universe, what is the nature of the universe that it exists such as to produce my ability to ask that question? Mm -hmm. That the, the planets are not moving in in a abiotic solar system. They're not just moving in the solar system. I'm not peering into the solar system from the outside. I'm actually looking at the planets from a planet which is teeming with life and human beings which are asking this question about how the universe is moving, how these planets are moving. So the real question Kepler's asking is, how do I look at the, how do I know what universe I am from the inside? The fact, the most fundamental question is the fact that I'm asking the question tells me something about the nature of the universe itself that I'm looking at. 
And this is the thing he talks about in the opening of the Mysterium Cosmographicum. In the opening of the Mysterium Cosmographicum, Kepler says, everybody asks the question, why are there six planets and why are they where they are? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, the reason why, th 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 and most people say, well, there isn't really an answer to that. But I know there must be an answer to it, even though I didn't, he didn't know what it was when he first asked the question. Because I'm asking the question. So the universe must be created in such a way that I can ask that question. Which means this, the answer to the universe must be contained somehow in the fact that I'm asking that I'm able to ask that question. Wow. Alright? And that's where he um, he says so in, if, God, if if it were totally arbitrary, if the universe were completely arbitrary, I, I would I could ask that question and the universe wouldn't I wouldn't be able to expect an answer. But the fact that I can ask that question and uh, uh, I, I'm I'm convinced is an in the is a uh, uh, demonstration that the universe has an answer to it. And of course then once he put his mind to it and discovered the answer both in terms of the ordering according to the five regular solids and the motion, the elliptical motions of the planets and the harmonic ordering of the planetary orbits Kepler um, uh, Kepler was able to uh, Kepler was able to um, uh, demonstrate uh, that uh, that the universe did give an answer to that question because he was able to show what nobody else was able to show whereas everybody else was simply able only to describe the appearances Ptolemy, Copernicus and Tycho Brahe in three very different ways and yet they got exactly the same results Kepler was able to to uh, answer the question in a way that had never been, uh, in a way that no one else was. But, uh, and in so doing, he uh, had to uh, demonstrate that the apparent non-uniform motions of the planets, the, parents, the, the planets didn't just look like they were moving non-uniformly, but they actually were moving non-uniformly. And that it was, and that this was an indication of the universe's perfectibility, higher, greater perfection, that it was moving non-uniformly. Then, were everything moving uh, uniformly in perfect circles? Because Kepler says finally in the end of the harmony, he said, you know, if if the if the Earth were not moving in the third place from the Sun in a non-uniform orbit, and the planets moving also in non-uniformly then there would be no way for the human mind to be able to discover these principles which I've just discovered. Right? And, the, and, uh, what, when I, what, and that discovery is not simply a discovery of the planet's, of some, of the planet's motion, it was a discovery about the, about the power of the human mind. So the fundamental discovery Kepler made was not simply a discovery of the motions of the heavenly bodies. The fundamental discovery Kepler made was a discovery about the power of the human mind, which itself tells you something about what the universe looks like from the inside. Now, um, this posed this question uh, of how to look at the universe from the inside as Kepler did, pose the question, which led to the next advance in this effort, which was Leibniz's discovery of uh, the calculus. And this is what the calculus is. The calculus, unlike what, what, if it, if what they teach in mathematics classes, the calculus is the method of trying to discover the universe from the inside. Because what you, what the, the, the way, and the key to this is Leibniz's idea of the infinitesimal, which is why so much effort was spent by Cauchy and others later to eradicate this idea of the infinitesimal from, from science. <coughs> As those of you who have worked through the catenary problem know, uh, that's the best way to sort of get, to, to, to really get this sense of, of how it works. Because the way the cat, what, what, what's the problem with the catenary? The same problem that, similar problem to what 
um, Kepler was confronting with the planetary orbits. Here you have this hanging chain, which has a physical power. As Brunelleschi demonstrated by using the catenary to construct the dome over the uh, cupola, uh, the, the, the vault of the church in Florence. It, no such freestanding dome had ever been built. Everybody thought it was impossible. And Brunelleschi demonstrated that the catenary had a, had a power that would enable him to do what everybody else said couldn't be done. Right? So what was that demonstrating? Something about the physical universe? Yes, but more importantly, something about the power of the human mind. So then the question comes, okay, well, what is the power this catenary has? Why does it do, why does it have that power, the effect that it does? So if the, the uh, attempts by Galileo and others to, to, to determine that by simply looking at the catenary, and describing how it looked were all failures. Because uh, um, Galileo said, well, it's a parabola. And a lot of people agreed with him because it looked like a parabola. And from the standpoint of mathematical formulas, the parabola was actually not a bad choice. Because if you take a really big uh, parabola and a really small chain, they're, they're close enough that they fit You know every... You can, you can scale your parabola and your chain such that you can get a very precise measurement using the parabolic curve, which is a very simple algebraic curve, right? As you all know from your elementary uh, coordinate geometry. Right? But Leibniz says, no, there's a, there's a fundamental principle here. It's not that. It's a little bit off. And this is another example of, of how this question works, of looking at the universe from the inside, because the key to genius versus idiots <laughs> is that the genius will recognize that when things are a little bit off, that that's the key to a new discovery. And it was Kepler's discovery that his attempts to try and determine the planetary <coughs> orbits using the conventional method the accepted method, even on a revolutionary way, led to a discrepancy of eight minutes of an arc. And Kepler recognized that was a that discrepancy was a matter of principle. He could get a calculation uh, that uh, to, to a greater degree of approximation. But what he was upset about was that there was not that that he didn't know the principle. Why was this discrepancy? And so he understood that discrepancy to be a matter of principle. And the same thing with um, uh, the same thing with um, Leibniz uh, and Bernoulli on the question of the catenary. That the difference between a catenary and a parabola may be small, but it's a matter of principle. And this is the key to the question also of of, of standing up for truth against sophistry. Of course, right now the the uh, discrepancy between sophistry and truth is quite large. <laughs> right? And you wonder why the hell can't people see this huge gap between what comes out of their mouth and what's really happening in the world, right? <laughs> right? You know, people say the economy's going well. And you say, yeah, but conditions of life for 80% of the world's population are getting worse. And they say, yeah, I know, but overall things are going well. <laughs> You know, and if, in other words, if some people, if a small percentage of the population are getting very rich, and it's going really well for them, then it must be that somehow this is going to be good for everybody, even though it's continuing to get worse for most people, right? Of course, but how does this discrepancy start? This discrepancy never starts with something that, what do you say, well, why, how can people accept such a huge discrepancy? It starts by them accepting a small discrepancy, something which is small compromise. And it's those little compromises that you make. You say, oh, well, this is just a small compromise with popular opinion. It's a compromise I have to make for practic pragmatic reasons now, right? You know, just in order, you know, because I don't want to freak too many people out, so I'll just, I won't really say the truth. I, I might believe the truth, but I'll, I'll decide not to say it this time, just because 
I don't want to freak people out, right? Mm -hmm. And when you accept those small discrepancies, which appear almost infinitesimal at the time, mm -hmm. you find that that infinitesimal uh, problem, discrepancy, becomes very, very, very big uh, when you see it expressed over an extended period of time. So that's why it's absolutely crucial in all our work and for anybody who wants to uh, uh, live a life in which you can face yourself in the mirror every day mm -hmm. is to not make any compromises on small discrepancies. Not just say, well, you know, I can let this thing slide. I can, I can cheat a little bit on the universe here. It's not going to know. <laughs> It'll know. <laughs> and you'll find out. <laughs> And when a whole culture does that, then you end up with the baby boomers. Not just a whole culture, but a whole culture over 30 years. Yeah. Well, that's how it started. It started out with the, it started out with the World War II generation. When Lynn talks about the, the, the compromises which people uh, uh, justified in his generation coming back from World War II in reaction to the fear they had when Roosevelt died, and Truman became president. And then instead of fighting Truman and fighting for what Roosevelt had done, people made compromises. They said, well, we've done our fighting. We spent five years in the Army. We've been through the Depression. We've made our sacrifices. Now we're gonna, now we're gonna you know, make our compromise. Oh yeah, well, I know it's not good to lie, but you have to do it in order to get ahead. And boom, 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 and then you get this small discrepancy in the World War II generation becomes a mass psychosis in the baby boomer generation. Mm -hmm. So, but this is the key to science, is not compromising on small discrepancies when it's a matter of principle. Now it's funny because Kepler will, will make compromises on matters of calculation that are much bigger than the, than the, principle, than the discrepancy which he didn't compromise on which was a matter of principle. So it's not the number which is the discrepancy. It's not the size of the discrepancy. It's the recognition that the discrepancy is a matter of principle. So this is what the catenary teaches us. The Leibniz and Bernoulli's fight on the catenary teaches us this question of, of uh, how to look at the universe from, from the inside by looking at these small discrepancies. So what does Leibniz and Bernoulli do? Leibniz and Bernoulli say, well, let's get in the catenary from the inside the same way Kepler does. Kepler says, okay, how, would the, how does the planet know how to move the way it's moving? How does the catenary know how to hang the way it's hanging so that it has this power? What is the principle? It's not a willful question, like a human idea, but it's a principle, but it's, a, it's like a human idea in the sense that it's a, it's a, um, it's a, a, a principle. And that, um, so, so Leibniz says, let's get, let me get, get into it from the inside. And he, and he, it's the same question that comes up with Fermat's principle of least time. Where Fermat looks at this paradox, that light under refraction moves the shortest distance, under reflection, and under refraction moves not the shortest distance. Well, so that's a discrepancy. Does the universe do two different things? Does the universe like shortest distance in some circumstances and not like shortest distance in other <laughs> circumstances? Right? And, and, and in one circumstance, it's very obvious. It's, it's not so obvious, but it's, it's, it's easy to understand. In the other, it seems to act according to some other principle. And Fermat says, no, it's a question of the universe always acts according to the principle of shortest distance, but shortest distance means something different depending on what the physical action is. And in the case of refraction, the physical action is a change in velocity of light, and therefore, it's least time. And that's the idea of the shortest distance, is least time. So the least time is the shortest distance. And then the reaction from Descartes was, well, this is ridiculous, because how would the light know how to find the path of least time, which assumes that it knows where it's going in order to be for and, and, can, and calculates ahead of time <laughs> what will be the shortest path to get there, right? And, and 
this is the argument Leibniz makes against the Cartesians, which where he says, no, it's not a question of of the of the light knowing like a mind. It's a question of the universe knowing that it constructs itself in such a way that the shortest time is the pathway of light. That this is the nature of light because there's a certain characteristic to the universe as a whole. Now what Leibniz discovers with the catenary is the fact that when you look at the at the catenary from the inside, you see that at every uh, part of the catenary, the relationship of the principles that are governing the catenary's curvature, the tension uh, against the gravitation, that these two principles are acting on this chain, and that the interaction between these two principles is always changing along the length of the catenary, but they're changing according to a principle. And then Bernoulli writes down the relationship by which they're changing, but can't solve that, that, that problem. So, so Leibniz then makes the brilliant discovery that this principle of change corresponds to this arithmetic mean between these two exponential curves. Right? But then you go back and you look at what these two exponential curves are, and you see their relationship from the idea of the arithmetic and the geometric action, that this catenary is expressing a principle which is a universal principle, which shows up in all these, everywhere you look in the universe, not just with respect to the, to the hanging chain. It's that the hanging chain hangs the way it hangs because it does something that's universal. That everywhere you look, you look on doubling the square, doubling the cube. You look at all these physical problems and you see this relationship that the chain seems to do so easily. Right? Now, Leibniz was able to solve this problem because he applied Kuz's method to Kepler's problem. And that is this question of how to look at the universe from the inside. He and that's what the Leibniz's idea of the infinitesimal is. Leibniz's idea of the infinitesimal is that the universal um, the universe, these universal principles exist everywhere in the universe, which means that every small interval of action in the universe this universal principles are acting. They may be acting differently <coughs> at every point, but they're always acting. And so the idea is to discover what, how do these principles, how are these principles differentiated at different points? That's called the differential. And the overall effect is the integration of all these differentials. That's called the integral. That's what Leibniz's differential and integral calculus is. And the key is this question of the infinitesimal. That the infinitesimal is the inverse of the universal. Now, um, so that's what Leibniz demonstrates with the, with the uh, idea of the infinitesimal calculus as best expressed by his work on the cat net. Now this becomes um, uh, um, uh, and uh, this and and what what Leibniz what this principle this principle of the changing effect of universal principles from point to point from place to place throughout the universe or over time. Um, becomes uh, what uh, uh, is given a more general concept by Gauss who calls this concept curvature. Now this is an important point because most people don't understand what's meant by curvature. When they think curvature, they think not straight. Mm -hmm. They think something that's bent. They think of a, when, when you see Gauss's paper on the uh, general investigations of curved surfaces, you think of some shape in a otherwise extended three-dimensional space 
which is generally flat and straight. And then you have these curved things that are in it. <laughs> right? Now, um, uh, but that's not what Gauss meant by curvature. Curvature is another word for principles. The curvature is the way the changing effect of principles expresses itself in a physical action. Now, Gauss uses an investigation into geometrical curved surfaces to give a pedagogical demonstration of this idea of curvature to help train the mind to think this way. But, um, uh, but Gauss had in mind the whole time not abstract geometrical surfaces embedded in three-dimensional space, but by what he had in mind was actual physical investigations. The two particular ones that he had uh, what was working on was his work on the uh, gravitation, uh, otherwise known as geodesy, and the other was earth magnetism, of which both of which he investigated. So, in other words, the surfaces that Gauss was actually investigating were not spheres and ellipsoids and catenoids and these other geometrical surfaces. The surfaces Gauss was investigating were actual the way physical principles change, the changing effect of physical principles, and that's what Gauss called curvature, right? And um, and and the methods he developed were uh, uh, applied in this, in as he would often say, in the clothing of geometry, so that you can get an intuitive sense of how this works. And then what Riemann did was extend this into domains which are beyond our intuition. Now that's what I want to actually spend a little time working on, what Gauss, to show you how Gauss did this. Okay. Now, the key, and the key element to this, the key idea that Gauss, uh, uh, sh how Gauss extended this idea of Riemann's uh, uh, I mean, of Leibniz's idea of the infinitesimal calculus is another way to think of Gauss's investigation of curved surfaces goes by another name of, called differential geometry. And the, dif the idea of differential geometry is the idea of investigating or understanding how physical principles change from the, st from the relationship of the infinitesimally small and the effect of that how that infinitesimally small interval expresses what's happening in the whole surface. And another aspect of this, which uh, Gauss was also uh, focused on, was this question of, um, which is also goes by the name of intrinsic geometry, or, which, in, which is another way of saying, how to discover the nature of the universe from the inside. Now, Can you repeat what differential geometry is how to investigate the changing effects of physical principles from the infinitesimally small, and how to recognize the universal principles from their expression in the infinitesimally small. Because this is really the way science works, right? You're, you're, for example, Kepler's discovery of the planetary, of the motions of the planetary orbits is in effect me 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 measuring or trying to discover the universal principles of planetary motion from a very small infinitesimal expression of those principles. But what did Kepler have? He had uh, 20 years, 25 years of data from Tycho Brahe. That's a really infinitesimally small interval of the solar system's development, right? <laughs> because when you're trying to look, when you're discovering the principles of planetary motion, you're not looking at the principles of planetary motion What's happening today, what's happening at the moment of time in which you're measuring the planet's motions, is only a small uh, interval of the evolution of the solar system over uh, billions and billions and billions of years. And, it's, and the motions of the planets today reflect that generative process from which the solar system was created. 
Right? And the same thing uh, uh, with, uh, for example, the um, the principle of the catenary. Okay, so <coughs> Gauss. Um, in Gauss, this is something similar to what Gauss was looking at in terms of both the practical problems in geodesy and electromagnetism are also examples of this. So once again, you see where you have a physical problem which a real scientist poses in such a way that the problem itself solves a universal, conforms to an investigation of the universe as a whole even when, uh, even though it's a particular problem. Just like Kepler's problem of how to solve the question of planetary motion, he posed the problem as how to solve, how, not, not, not simply how to determine what the planets were doing, but how to recognize something about the universe as a whole. So this is the problem Gauss is looking at. Take the question of geodesy. The simple question of how to determine what the overall shape of the Earth is. Now, since you can't see the whole Earth, and you can't measure the whole Earth, how do you determine from measuring small parts, infinitesimally small pieces of the Earth's surface, what the overall shape of the Earth's surface is? Well, the first thing you have to ask yourself, what was it, first of all, poses a general problem. That is, how from the infinitesimally small do you discover the whole principle? The second thing is similar similar problem comes up with magnetism. What what do you what do you mean? In the first question, how do you how do you determine from small measurements of variations in the Earth's magnetic effect the overall characteristic of the Earth's magnetic field, which at that time wasn't known, and to this day is not really known. We have better measurements, but we don't really know it. So the first question you have to ask yourself, so these are, these are two practical questions. How do you know from small measurements the overall effect? What the universal principle that these small measurements are, occur, are taking place? Okay, so that's, that's how it's posed in a in general way. So the first question you have to ask yourself, well, okay, well, what is it that we mean by, what do we actually mean by the surface of the Earth? Is it the surface you're standing on? Well, you know, if you're standing on the side of a hill, you're, you're, you think that the, the surface you're standing on is, is here. But if you drop a plumb bob, the plumb bob points to some different place. That's not the same surface that you're standing on. Yeah. So the surface you're actually measuring is the surface that's everywhere perpendicular to the direction of the plumb bob. It's not something you stand on. It's not something you see. The plumb bob points in a certain direction because gravity pulls it that way. But that's not anything you see. So the actual surface you're measuring is something different. That's why Gauss came up with, with this idea, which today is called the geoid, that the surface of the Earth is that surface which is everywhere perpendicular to the pull of gravity. Now, as you move around and measure, yeah? Uh, how, how much is like, you know, what? Who is it from the Earth? How is, is that like a, a similar notion? Yeah, because he measured it from a small change in the angle, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But what he measured was the, around the meridian. But that doesn't help you measuring the, sure, the, the, uh, the uh, circumferential, the l latitudinal direction, right? Because his thing was based on the changing angle of the sun, mm -hmm. right? But the angle of the sun doesn't change for equal latitude. Right? It only changes with a change in longitude. <coughs> so his method could measure the curvature of the Earth in this direction, but it can't measure the curvature of the Earth in the other direction. So this was a much more general way. How do you actually measure the overall curvature of the Earth? Or in a, what, what would Gauss mean, the overall surface that is perpendicular to the pull of gravity, which we call, it, which is the only surface we can measure. Because when you look at the whole Earth, even the biggest mountains are, are nothing. They don't, have, they don't affect the curvature of the Earth at all. The tallest mountains are teeny compared to the whole Earth. <laughs> so the, whole, the surface of the curvature of the surface of the Earth is a, is a, um, um, is a, is a, a broader question. So 
Um, okay, so, uh, and you have to do this while you're on the Earth. Right? You, ha you can't do it from out in space looking down, or certainly Gauss couldn't, but even today, you can't just go out in space and look down at the Earth and look at it like a little ball or something like that and say, well, okay, that's the curvature. Mm -hmm. How do you actually measure it? The same thing with geomagnetism is the other example that he spent a lot of time looking at. Because how, what, do you, what do you know by variations of the Earth's magnetic field? What you know is how the Earth's magnetic field affects a compass needle. And Gauss came up with a way to measure the changes in the intensity uh, of the Earth's magnetic field. So you go around the surface of the Earth and you make tiny, tiny measurements. And Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt organized this, which was the first global, global physical experiment. And he organized this global experiment in which they made these small measurements all over the surface of the, all over the Earth of the variations in the Earth's magnetic field. And from these small measurements, Gauss drew an entire atlas that showed the overall shape of the Earth's magnetic effect. So from very small measurements from being inside, Gauss was able to measure the whole effect of the Earth's magnetic field. Are there now, existing images of that? Huh? Of his drawing? Yeah, it's in his collected work. Yeah. <coughs> this is a really fascinating atlas. Now, um, so Gauss took this, these two physical examples, and and developed the method by which he applied to these examples, which was, uh, which is what his um, principles, uh, investigation, general investigations in the curved surfaces is about. It's about how do you actually determine this. Now, the first thing he does in his general investigation of curved surfaces is he um, uh, develops the means by which you uh, can actually uh, uh, conceive of a measure of curvature uh, of the surface. And there are, there were, and this is, this is sort of an extension of what Kepler, I mean of what, um, uh, this is an extension of what Leibniz did with his principle of, with the development of the infinite decimal calculus. Talking about how, what is the curvature at a point along a curve. And Gauss, uh, first of all, said, well, let's think about what are we, what are we talking about with a, with a, a, a curved surface. Now, up until that time, Euler and everybody else had thought of curved surfaces as being um, uh, curved objects, things that were not straight. Curved objects that were otherwise embedded in a three-dimensional space which was, which was flat, essentially flat. So like if you think of a sphere, the sphere would be embedded in a big box, right? And it would be the parts of the box that were equidistant from the center. Now, Gauss, first of all, said that you can remove this problem by changing your conception of, the, of, a, of any curved surface. And take, we'll take the case of the sphere as an example. And instead of thinking of it as embedded in a box, you can think about it as... Um, uh, as a two-dimensional surface. Now the first person in doing this, Gauss actually was adopting an idea which had already been developed by Kepler in the second book of the Mysterium Cosmographicum, where Kepler makes a distinction between a sphere and a globe. And Kepler talks about the sphere being purely curved, because it's just the surface whereas the globe, which contains the inside of the sphere as well as the surface, is, as Kepler says, is a mixture of the curved and the straight. So Gauss is going back, goes back to Kepler's idea and says, we're not, I'm not talking about the inside of the sphere. I'm talking about the 
spirits, the, the surf, just the surface itself. Now, at first, Gauss says, "Well, you can, you can, you can, you can show how this works because you can, you can measure every point on the surface of the sphere by two angles: an angle this way and an angle this way." Right? Now, that's the way the mathematician would look at it, but that's not the way Gauss looked at it because that's not true. Because when you look at it as an angle this way and an angle this way, you're already not on the surface of the sphere. You're measuring those angles from the center of the sphere. And we just got through saying that we're disregarding the, in we're just looking at the surface. So how do you measure these angles, this angle and this angle, from which you can determine every point on the surface of the sphere, from the center of the sphere with, by, w it, w without having to resort to the center of the sphere. How do you measure just from the surface of the sphere itself? Okay. So you're assuming you're on, the, you're, you're on, the, on the surface of whatever this thing is. Yeah. And how do you... Okay. Well, just think about the surface of the sphere. You can think of the surface of the sphere, and you can think about latitude and longitude on the surface of the sphere, right, as being able to determine exactly every point by those two angles, right, on the surface of the sphere. Now, but the problem is, is that on the surface of the, if you, those two angles, latitude and longitude, are measured as angles from the center of the sphere. So now you're back to the, your Euclidean oh, geometry. Okay. Because if you're not thinking of the surface of the sphere, you're thinking of the center of the sphere. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually find latitude? And, how would you find latitude, or in other words, how would you find latitude and longitude if you're on the surface of the sphere? Mm -hmm. right? Okay, well this requires, this, this gets us into the question of what... Um, uh, Gauss identified as intrinsic, or what's later called as intrinsic geometry. And it begins with another idea that Gauss uh, recognized, or d d uh, demonstrated, which is that on any surface, in this case we're talking about the surface of the sphere, but in any surface, there's, if you have any two points on the surface, and they're close enough together, th then there's uh, an infinite number of lines which go through that, go through those two points. But there's one of those lines which is the shortest line. Now he didn't use the term geodesic, but that's the term we apply to that now, geodesic, which is the shortest line on the surface of the sphere, on any surface, right? Now I say close together because you can have two points, say on the sphere, like the North and South Pole, in which there's an infinite number of lines which are the shortest lines between those two points, right? So, <coughs> that's something else you find out about the sphere. Okay? So how do you find out, how do we do this, this intrinsic geometry? Well, Gauss says, look, if you take, if you take any point on, this, on a curved surface and you uh, have Coming out from that point, you take any point, and you have coming out from that point an infinite number of, or any number, of shortest lines. And those shortest lines are the same length. Then the line, the curve connecting the endpoints of that line, will intersect all those lines perpendicularly. So in the case of a flat surface, that's a circle. Then Gauss showed also more generally, if you have on a curved surface any line, and you have a series of lines coming off that line, which are of the same length, the line connecting the endpoints of that will intersect those geodesics at 90 degrees, always at 90 degrees. So from this standpoint, you can actually determine a 
set of curves, two sets of curves, one of which are geodesic curves, which will be at 90 degrees to each other, that you can do from being on the surface itself. So in this way, you can get latitude and longitude, for example, on the surface of a sphere without having to resort to the center of the sphere itself. You just start with any arbitrary curve. You lay off geodesic lines that are the same length, and then you connect the endpoints of the geodesic lines, and you uh, proceed from there. Yeah. Um, but... Okay, I understood. I understood when you uh, said that the two angles would require uh, a center, which mathematicians would love. But weren't latitude and longitude developed without the benefit of knowing the center of the Earth? No, the latitude and longitude were developed by thinking of the center of the, thinking about the Earth as the center of the celestial sphere, yeah. and then projecting. The, the curves on the celestial sphere onto the Earth. Yeah. Yeah, well, so that's the sense, that's a three, that's, that's, that's not on the surface. So they just used an imaginary device to... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you explain that one more time with the geo... Because I thought you just said the geodesic is the shortest pathway. The shortest pathway. So what do you mean by taking a curve? You take... It, but if you have any curve on a... on a... on a any curve like this, and you draw geodesics to that curve, which are all of the same length, that, that intersect that curve perpendicularly, and you connect the endpoints of those curves, the, the, the resulting curve will also intersect them at 90 degrees. Right? So you can make, on any surface, you can create a system of curves, one of which are geodesics, and the other of which are any curve whatsoever, and establish, a, in effect, a doubly extended mag manifold. What Riemann would later call a doubly extended manifold. Without having to resort to the surface to a, uh, a Euclidean space at all. Would the second curve be the same curve? What do you mean the same curve? Perpendicular? This one? As you originally did. Yeah. No. Doesn't that doesn't have to be, depending on what the surface is. <laughs> now, um, okay. Now, so this, then, then there's another uh, uh, characteristic and that Gauss uh, question raised, which is how do we actually measure the curvature, what he called curvature, the change, the, the, the changing effect on this of this system over the extent extent of the surface. Now, up until Gauss, Euler had done this by taking a curve, I don't know if I have an image of this, let's let me see. No, I don't, I don't have it, but I have it somewhere. But by taking a, a surface, and if you take a, uh, a surface and you cut the surface perpendicular to the, uh, if you have any point on that surface, and you cut the surface perpendicularly, then that with a plane, then that, then the surface, the cut traces out a curve on the plane. And if you cut it another, if you cut the surface perpendicular to that, it will trace out another curve on the perpendicular to it. And, yeah. I would greatly enjoy some proof of that. <laughs> what? Uh, of that, I, I, cause I, I, th I think about it constantly and I see it everywhere, but I have yet, and me and Nico were thinking about this, is 
how uh, is, is a proof of that? A proof that they're always a, that the, that the ninety degree cuts of the curves of minimum and maximum yeah. curvature. Yeah, it's a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not actually it's not actually that hard to prove. You think about it a little bit, you'll see why it's the case. Okay, so and then then at, if you take these two curves at the point, there is a circle, which is the biggest circle that touches that curve at one point. And in the other direction, there's another circle, which is the biggest circle which touches that curve at that point. Those are called the oscillating <coughs> circles. And one measure of curvature is the to, to multiply the radii of these two circles together and take the inverse of that. And that Euler called the measure of curvature. So in other words, if, if you have uh, a very large number, you take the inverse so that it becomes very small. In other words, if the, if the, if the surface is, is not very curved, then the, then the osculating circle is very large. So you take the inverse of it, and that makes the measure of curvature small. And if you take the, per the if it's very curved, then the circle is very small, and that makes your measure of curvature very small. No, Euler had that. Yeah. The measure of curvature. Now, the, the point is, what Gauss did was something different. Gauss said, well, okay, how can I actually measure the curvature from the surface itself? Now, think about that, right? You're, ta you're thinking about measuring the, curve, the curvature of a, of a watermelon or something, right? And you're thinking about it on the surface by looking at it from the outside. So you cut the watermelon one way and you cut it another way and you measure the osculating circles and you get a measure of curvature at any point, right? Okay. Well, Gal said that, that ac actually you can measure the curvature at every point by um, <coughs> from the surface itself. Okay? And there are two ways he did this, both of which are important. So let's. What's that? One thirty two. Yeah. Huh? It's 64 hertz? Okay. So here's our here's our sphere. We'll use this as an example. Well, actually, we'll start with this one, which I I used last time, right? Okay. Here's a flat surface. Okay. Now, one way Gal said we can understand this by recognizing the way in which a flat surface, the way in which on a, a flat surface we can measure the length of the shortest of the shortest line by the uh, Pythagorean theorem. Okay? And the flat surface is a very <coughs> trivial case, the surface of a plane, because any straight line is a geodesic. Whereas if you look at this on the surface of a sphere, now you have something different, and we'll, we'll look at the close-up a little bit easier. Because these curves in this direction, the longitude lines, are your geodesics. 
these curves are always perpendicular. The latitude lines are always perpendicular to the geodesic, right? Mm -hmm. And these curves here, if they're geodesic lines, you see they're different for each each little uh, patch here, okay? So the effect of the curvature of the sphere or any other surface can be measured by the changing relationship of the way in which you measure a geodesic line with respect to the orthogonal system of curves that you set up from being on your on the surface. Right? Okay. You can the effect of the curvature of the surface is expressed by the relationship of the geodesic, the length of the geodesic line as with respect to the two sets of orthogonal curves that uh, you've already set up, right? You set up your, you, you have a, a set of, a set of geodesic lines and a set of curves that are perpendicular to it, right? And the, the uh, geodesic, the length of the geodesic lines uh, that are, say, the hypotenuse of these triangles changes according to, by the effect of the curvature of the surface on that relationship. So in the case of the sphere, it's a very simple relationship in that as you get closer to the North Pole or to any of the poles, the uh, shape of these geodes these triangles changes. Now, I made an animation to illustrate this a little easier. Does it start from a flat surface? Or does it start no. Huh. Hmm. Not a flat surface. I'll start from the opposite surface. Okay, so there you can see see the effect of the curvature of the sphere on that triangle, right? Okay? Whoops. Now, if you take away the, the, if you take away the lines, you still have the effect of the curvature, right? On the triangle. And in fact, if you take away the surface and just have the triangle. <laughs> you see the triangle changing, and you can imagine the, the curvature, right? <laughs> so, so Gauss's point is you don't even, you, you, the, the, you know the curvature of the surface by the effect it has on the changing on the change of this triangle. Yeah. How could you measure that triangle, though? I mean, I guess the question is, how could you use the Pythagorean theorem on a curved surface? Well, okay. The way you, you what you have to do is to th that this is what Gauss this is what Gauss uh, uh, breakthrough is that he generalized the Pythagorean theorem to the curved surfaces to a curved surface. Okay. So that what you have is a uh, a system of orthogonal curves, one of which are geodesic lines. Then, and remember that you're measuring the whole surface, the curvature of the surface, from the characteristic change as you move around that surface. You can't measure the curvature of the whole surface from one point any more than you can determine the entire catenary from one point. The way you know the catenary is by the way the effect of the catenary principle changes from infinite at, in, at every infinitesimal moment. Not at one infinite the whole thing is expressed in one infinitesimal moment. But unless you ch unless you measure it at different points, you don't you can't measure the change. So what you're measuring is the change. So you measure how these triangles change, the, how the shape of this triangle changes. Uh, with respect to a um, uh, the curvature of the surface. Now, there are basically three ways that the triangle, that the shape of this triangle can change. Okay? 
One way, you see, um, okay, you see here, where as the triangle gets, or actually, let's go back to this one. No, not that one. This one. Okay. So you can see that as this triangle gets closer to the pole, the um, length of the, uh, this, the horizontal side, for lack of a better term, gets shorter and shorter for equal, equal proportions that way, okay? Another, uh, Uh, example. Uh, another way things can, can change is this is on the case of a spheroid, where you can see that not only do the not only does the um, not only does the horizontal line change as you get closer to the North Pole, but so do the vertical lines. They get longer. Okay. Which one stays constant in the square? The the vertical line stays constant in the square. Yeah, like the right, and the horizontal line gets shorter. Okay. Okay. okay so so those are those are two two parameters that you have to add to the to the uh, Pythagorean theorem. One is a parameter that expresses how the horizontal line, how one set of curves, one set of those orthogonal curves changes, and that, and the other is how the other set of orthogonal curves changes as you move around. So those two, uh, you see, those two, uh, uh, what Gauss showed is those two, you can set up a function that expresses how those things changes in terms of the the two sets of curves. Mm -hmm. And those become coefficients that you have with your Pythagorean theorem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is Make the uh, diagonal staying the same? No. The, the diagonal is changing. Yeah. Do you think there would be a particular service where although the two sides of the triangle were both changing, the diagonal stay the same? Um, um. Yeah. What? Yeah, there would be one. I think you know what it is, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, how, how do you know if, if uh, the, the height is changing from your perspective? Well, this is just a computer drawing. Do the experiment on an actual physical surface. Do, do it on a... Get, get a sphere. you got a Leonard sphere. Get a watermelon. A good, nice ellipsoidal shape. Get some funny shapes and do these things, right? So, so one of these. So Gauss gave names to these functions, and he wrote them out. And they're they're, they're somewhat long functions, but <coughs> but if your Pythagorean theorem is s squared, which is the length of your diagonal, is equal to um, x squared plus y squared. Okay. Give myself a little more room. Okay. The eraser behind you. Bruce, you said there were three ways of triangle. Okay, wait. Yeah. But I've only I've only described two. Okay. Okay. So the first the first wave changes. That is, if one of the one of the one of the orthogonal lines changes, that changes according to a function, and he gave that function the letter E. And he wrote it out. I'm not writing it out here. Okay. Then the way the other one fun changes, he gave, he said you have to multiply it by another function, which he called g. Okay. Now, the third way it changes can be expressed this way. If you look at the sphere, when you move, <coughs> this damn PowerPoint we need. There we go. When you move in this direction, 
you see that neither the horizontal or the vertical changes. Okay? That's on a sphere. That's on a sphere. And the same thing is true for an ellipsoid. I mean, for a spheroid. Neither the vertical or the horizontal changes. It changes, in the, in the, for the spheroid, they both change. E and G have a value in this direction. But E and G are, but there is no change in this direction. Okay? But if you take another surface, an ellipsoid, you see that now when you move in that perpendicular direction, you get a change in both E and G. Okay? Which one is going to be? No, you get a change in the, in the, you see the horizontal and vertical lines both change as you move in this direction. Okay? So he, he for that, you need another coefficient, which he called F. For the latter example? Yeah. So E is the uh, horizontal and G is the vertical? Right. And so since these changes are taking place in small infinitesimal intervals, You can therefore generalize the Pythagorean theorem to this. Instead of the Pythagorean theorem, you get this function as an expression of the uh, of the you get uh, as an expression of the curvature of the surface. So where we are now is Gauss showed that you can determine by <coughs> the changes, you can measure by the changes in the uh, in the way in which these triangles change as you move around the surface, you can actually determine the curvature from the surface itself without thinking about three-dimensional, without thinking about embedded in the Euclidean space. Yeah. Um. D represents the change, right? Yeah. Okay. There's small intervals. Okay. Okay. Now, then Gauss showed how you could take this measure of curvature that 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 uh, I described earlier as the sum, I mean the product of these two oscillating circles, and he showed how you can express that quantity simply by these quantities. It's a very long, complicated equation. I'm not entirely sure why that's still considered the Pythagorean theorem or even a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. Because what it does is it expresses how the length of a geodesic, uh, how, how, what the, how you can measure the length of the geodesic relative to this by, by reference to the, these orthogonal curves mm -hmm. anywhere on the surface. Just like you measure the length of of that line by the sum of the square root of the sum of the squares of these two sides, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So on a curved surface, you have to measure the length of a curved line. Your cur your geodesic looks more like this. Right, and so the length here is longer than this, than, this, than the straight line, right? So the but there's something similar to the Pythagorean theorem, which can express the length of this curve by the sum of this the sum by this function, which is not simply the sum of the squares. Do yeah. What is it about in the case? Wait, I mean, the case of a flat line, e, f, and g are all zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, or I'm sorry, e, e, and g are one, and f is zero. Yeah. So, a flat plane? Yeah. Yeah. so what is it about a flat plane which would make the Pythagorean theorem expressed in terms of triangles and squares? Well, the same thing. This is expressed in terms of the triangles and squares, but the, but, the, but the size of these triangles and squares are curves. So, they're, so the, the lengths are not the same. 
as a straight line because they're geodesics, but they're geodesics on a, they're straight lines from the standpoint of the surface. But because the surface is curved, there's a new principle that's, that's, that, that's uh, changing the relationship of length with respect to position. Right, because where you are on the curve, on the surface, changes the relationship of length with respect to position. Hmm. I just when I think about the Pythagorean theorem, I know how to prove it because I can, I can sort of geometrically arrange the square areas mm -hmm. to show that they're equal. But I don't understand how you would be able to do that to show that this equation would be equal because it doesn't seem like you can do that. Equal to what? These the square of s and the square of x and the square of y. It doesn't it's not the that. square of x and the square of the ds. It's all these things. And e, f, and g are not yeah. numbers, but they're functions. E, f, and g are... So you have to multiply dx squared by something, by, by a factor. Mm -hmm. Say it's the case of the sphere. You have to multiply dx squared by a factor depending on where that dx squared is on the surface of the sphere. So this this is a function mm -hmm. that changes. It's the cosine of of, of y. Is so as you get closer and closer to the to the to the north pole, you have to multiply your horizontal length by some number, which shortens it. So the function expresses the curvature of the surface. Yes. Exactly. How do you, how do you know that? How, well, that's what the function. That's how you measure. It, it's the, it's characterized by the by the surface itself, by the curvature of the surface itself. In other words, yeah, you're on the surface, right? How would you know the function of the curvature? You measure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you measure you measure your geodesic lines, and as you move around the surface, you see how much you have to adjust your geodesic lines are. Now, let me just say, this is a more complicated way. Gauss came up with a much simpler way to do it, which I'm going to tell you in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Which is which makes this, which makes the whole thing more simple, right? But this is one way he did it, right? Which is he showed that you can express the curvature of the surface simply by the way you measure geodesic lines. You can express the curvature of the surface simply by the way you measure the geodesic lines as you move around the surface. Okay. Now. Here's the simple way he did it. After that, he came up with something which is much much simpler, but also extremely uh, profound. <coughs> which is that on any curved surface, you have a, a discrepancy between the sum of the angles of the triangle uh, at 180 degrees. On a flat surface, on a plane, a Euclidean plane, the sum of the angles of a triangle are always 180 degrees. Right? Does anybody disagree with that? Wait, do you <laughs> that? <laughs> I said on a flat plane, the sum of the angles of every triangle is always 180 degrees. Right? That's the key to Euclidean geometry. That's why Euclidean geometry is not true. Because if you don't have the, uh, the, if you don't have triangles that are where the sum of the angles is always the same, then you don't have uh, similar triangles, right? So the sum of the uh, on a Euclidean plane, the sum of the angles of a triangle is always 180 degrees. Okay, but on a curved surface, the sum of the angles of a triangle are always either greater or less than 180 degrees. They're never 180 degrees. On the case of a sphere, on the case of a sphere, <laughs> the one he was made. <laughs> uh, the famous, the famous triangle, right, from from the North Pole to the equator, over 90 degrees, and up to the North Pole again, right? <laughs> right? That has three 90 degree angles in it, right? So the sum of the angles of that triangle are 270 degrees. Okay. So what Ga Gauss showed is that the sum of the angles, and of course the sum of the angles of the triangle, or on a negatively curved surface, 
the sum, on a positively curved surface, the sum of the angles of the triangle are always greater than 180 degrees. On a negatively curved surface, the sum of the angles of the triangle are always less than 180 degrees. And there's a relationship between the how much greater than 180 degrees and how much less than 180 degrees and the area of the triangle. The area of the triangle encompasses. So on a triangle that's this triangle, that's 90, 90, 90, that covers one eighth of the surface of the sphere. Okay? And that, the, 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 the um, excess over 180 degrees, which is called the spherical excess, Gauss calls it the spherical excess, for that triangle is 90 degrees, because it's 90 degrees more than 180, and it covers one-eighth of the sphere. Okay, If I have a triangle that goes from the North Pole to the equator, and say over 45 degrees, and then up to the equator, that triangle has a 45 degree angle, uh, a 90 degree angle and a, and a 90 degree angle. So that makes uh, 180, uh, 235 degrees. So its excess is only 45 degrees and that triangle covers 1 16th of the area of the sphere. Smaller area. Yeah. So you're looking at the relationship between the area and, and, the, and, the, the, and the excess or defect of the sum of the angles of the triangle. Relative to the area of the triangle itself covers. Relative to the area of the triangle itself covers, correct. Okay? Relative to the area of the triangle covers. That's the way, that's the first way to, to, to approximate it. Now, um, Gauss, to, to, to make this uh, um, more uniform, make this more uniform. Let me go back to this one. Let's stop this one. Okay. To make this more uniform, Gauss introduced this way of measuring the, the curvature, which is to, if you have a, uh, a curve which is normal to the surface, uh, and you project the directions that this white line makes as if it were at the center of the surface, it traces out a area on the sphere. So this area is called, is, is another measure of curvature. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is at the center of the sphere. It's just as if you were, you were, uh, this, this, um, ellipsoid here, were in the very center of the sphere, but it was really small, and as it moved around, it would trace out a big area on the sphere. So the area, the areas of this surface, which are more curved, will produce a bigger area on the sphere, and the areas that are less curved will make a smaller area, will trace out a smaller area of the sphere. So you can do the same thing with the triangle. You can make you can trace out the area of the tr uh, a triangle, the boundary of the triangle, and that will trace out a certain area of the on the sphere. And so the parts of the triangle, if the triangle is on a surface that's more curved, then the then the sum of the excess over 180 degrees will be greater, and consequently the area it spreads out over the area it, it, um, it uh, expresses on the surface of the, the sphere is greater. So Gauss showed that the curvature 
is uh, uh, the, the curvature, the very same measure of curvature, can be expressed by the ratio of the sum of the angles of the triangle, or the, I'm sorry, the <coughs> excess or defect of the sum of the angles of the triangle, divided by the area that that triangle encompasses, or the spherical uh, map of that area, either one. Yeah? Why, why would the recurrent be to the triangle as one of these? You're saying the excess is how much more than... Because on any curved any surface, on a sphere, for example, the sum of the angles of the triangle are always greater, on a positively curved surface, are always greater than 180 degrees. If it's 180 degrees, it becomes a point. So on a triangle. Okay? On a negatively curved surface, the sum of the angles of the triangle are always less than 180 degrees. The difference is that the excess gets greater the bigger the triangle. It is it's bigger. And on the uh, negatively curved surface, the defect gets smaller the bigger the triangle. Right? So the, as the triangle gets smaller and smaller and smaller on a negatively curved surface, the sum of the angles of the triangle get closer and closer to 180 degrees. And when it gets to a point, then it becomes 180 degrees. So no triangle whose angles equal 180 degrees exists on a curved surface. So but you still be measuring th but this this function should well I mean that's 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 the thing that we're actually measuring, right? Because if that's if, if this that's function. true yeah, well, yeah, well the, the the question of how the triangles are changing relative I was just trying to figure out like why would you refer to the the, the, the triangle or the plane? Um, it seems somewhat simple, but no, you, 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 you say the triangle on the plane is the only triangle which never exists. The one that everybody believes in is the one that doesn't <laughs> exist. Okay. <laughs> 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 Sacred. So you look at all the actual triangles versus... You, you, yeah, that's right. For all, all real triangles. And so the point is, is that there's a relationship of the sum of the angles of the triangle and the area that triangle encompasses. And that relationship is a function, Gao showed, of the curvature of the surface. So to measure the curvature of the surface while you're on the surface, there's two ways to do it. One is this way, which is a little more complicated. And the other is this way, which is actually more simple, which is you measure the sum of the angles, so that the excess or defect, over or less than 180 degrees, and the ratio of that excess or defect to the area the triangle encompasses is a measure of curvature. That's how you measure the curvature of a curved surface while you're on the surface. And he did that while doing geodesy, or doing the mapping of yeah. yeah, well that was, his, that was his laboratory where he yeah. tested out these ideas, right? But he was interested, it's again, Dan, it's very much like, and I, it's important to emphasize this, it's very much like what Kepler was doing. He was solving a problem, a, a, a practical problem, how to determine the planetary orbit. But he was solving the practical problem by demonstrating a universal capability of the human mind, right? How to actually see the universe from the inside. So Gauss had this practical problem. He was actually thinking about this before he did the geodesy. I guess. It's hard to say. Was he thinking about this before he did the geodesy, or was he thinking about the geodesy before he did this? It doesn't really work that way, right? How does you, how do you, how, when you when you you're you're drawn to certain practical problems, you recognize that certain practical problems are really fundamental problems that have to be solved because you recognize in them not something practical, but something universal, right? That's why you're drawn to those problems in the first place, because you're saying, you know, th I can see something universal in this problem. So it's not, and, and that's important to emphasize, because we're, we're, it's so much emphasized in modern science today, this idea of necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. 
right? That you you know you walk along and stub your toe, and then you figure out how to not stub your toe, right? Well, that's not looking at a principle that holds Yeah. Not stub your toe. Right. Yeah, at least the end of the race. Can you repeat what you said to Ed about how you look at how you measure, I guess, the surface of? I'm saying what Gauss says is that you, me you can measure the curvature of the surface mm -hmm. by the ratio of the increase or decrease over 180 degrees that the sum of the angles of a geodesic triangle have over the area that triangle encompasses. If the surface is more curved, then, that's, then you're going to have a um, uh, then you're going to have a different ratio than if it's less curved. You're going to have less curve than the bigger the triangle gets. You mean more curve than like that triangle? Yeah, as in, imagine, it, see, I should imagine a watermelon, okay? Um. So the t part of the watermelon that's up here is not that curved, right? So if you draw triangles on that part of the watermelon, they're going to look like triangles on a flat plane. They'll look a little bit different, right? But, but then if you draw triangles on the, this part oh. here, they're going to be more curved, right? Yeah. Okay? So different parts of the surface will be more curved or less curved. You see, you see a, a curvature of hyperinflation when you try and buy cantaloupes. And things, so. Okay, so you see on this surface right here, that's more curved, whereas this triangle here, and these of course are not necessarily, deep, are, is less curved. See the sum of the angles of that triangle are less than 180 degrees, or closer to 180 degrees, where this triangle, you can see that these angles are more than 180 yeah. degrees. Okay, so you're saying you want to compare, like, if you wanted to compare, uh, you want to compare two triangles in the same area, you can see how the, the, the their angles change. Then you get more curvature. Then you get a measured curvature. Yes, correct. But you can only, you can only know the curvature of, like, that, that part of your surface, or yeah, you measure the you measure the curvature at every small point. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this goes back to the Pythagorean theorem, though, because the the problem with it, because on flat surfaces we use squares to measure area, and on a curved surface you can't well, draw a square. Yeah, you can. It you becomes can. a trapezoid. Yeah. Well, but that's all a square is. A square is just a special case of a of a parallelogram. Hey, Bruce, so does it matter if you... <laughs> 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 you, don't have to use squares. you don't have to use squares on a flat surface. You can use any shape you want to measure area. You actually use triangles. The way you, know, you measure a square, how do you measure the area of a square? <laughs> you have to say D is squared. There you go. <laughs> uh, Matt, Matt had said that you're trying to find two triangles with the same area and then comparing to its angles. Would it matter if you took two triangles with the same angles and seeing what their angles are? Yeah, you could do that too. Mm -hmm. Right? In other angles? words, what the measure of curvature is the way the ratio between the increase or decrease of the sum of the angles varies with area. But you can have an infinite amount of triangles with sure. the same area. Yeah. Which, well, no, not no, no, no. The the <laughs> point is, is that for example, on a sphere, uh -huh. let's just take a sphere. Yeah. If you take a, a 90, 90, 90 triangle, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. every 90, 90, 90 triangle will encompass one eighth of the surface of the sphere. You okay. cannot have a 90, 90 triangle that encompasses less than an eighth of, or more than an eighth of a sphere. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at angles first and comparing the angles to the area. area. Sorry. Yeah, Megan. I'm just uh, looking at what you're comparing there, where like each one is the same normal, and it's ta it's missing out the area that's right. being looked at is different. Yeah. Can you just say like how how with each one of those, like how the triangle, how the triangles are different, how the triangles are changing? Well, here I should actually do an animation. <laughs> I didn't have time to do but if I were to draw a geodesic triangle on here mm -hmm. and draw my, uh, have this 
have the um, like if I were to to draw this this uh, see how this the direction of this changes as this moves along here right and then I were to map that onto a sphere then that would make a triangular area on the sphere right mm -hmm. so this is just not a triangular area right but that area on the sphere that would be the way you can actually measure the area of this triangle yeah how do you figure out the area of the curve Because you're looking at the, yeah, no, but you can't, you can't, and the point is, is that if you, if you're going to preserve lengths, then you can't preserve areas, uh, uh, angles, and if you're going to preserve angles, then you can't preserve lengths. In other words, another way to think about this in general terms, and what you're, what you're not used to, because you're thinking Euclidean, right, on Euclidean plane, you're thinking that if you increase the length of the size of a polygon, and, and this, in this, I'm sorry, Tim left, but it, the, it, you can fill them in. Okay, the point is that it's not, we're not just dealing with triangles or the simplest polygon, but the same principle applies to every polygon, to squares, to any the polygon with any, Tim, this describes, this, this expresses not just with triangles, the Gauss theorem. What he called he called it the, the theorema egregium, which means remarkable theorem. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what egregious means. It's really outstanding, right? <laughs> we usually provide a negative context, the context of the word egregious, but egregium in in uh, Latin it means outstanding. It's a superlative, right? So it it it, it pertains to every polygon, not just two triangles, right? So in other words, a, a spherical square has an excess uh, over the, a, a plane square has four 90 degree angles. So the, the sum of the angles of a plane square is 360 degrees. But a spherical square will always have the sum of an angles which are greater than 360 degrees. And the how much greater is a function of how big the square is. Okay, so you're used to thinking in Euclidean space that if you increase the length of the side, you'll increase the area, but the sum of the angles will remain the same. Okay, but in the case of a curved surface, there's a relationship, a different type of relationship between length and area. It's not a simple proportional relationship between length and area. There's a different relationship, and that relationship, Gauss said, is the measure of curvature of that surface. Okay? Now, what Riemann did was he extended that to surfaces that are greater than he took Gauss's example of, of a curved surface and said, well, this is just a, this is a, an example of a doubly extended, what he would call a doubly extended manifold. But that for, uh, you can extend this to multiply extended manifolds of any number of dimensions. But the dimensions for Riemann were not uh, left, right, up, down, back, forth. They were physical principles. The way in which physical, the number of physical principles that were varying. So, for example, he did a paper in which he uh, t uh, um, 
to demonstrate this, uh, of the uh, uh, changing relationship of, of, of heat in a metal disc over time. So you're dealing with a quadruply extended manifold there because you have two dimensions of distance. You have heat, increase, increase and decrease in temperature, and you have time. So there's the four parameters. So that forms a quadruply extended manifold. And he used this as an example to introduce what he introduced in the uh, curve in the habilitation paper, which is that in, in principle, on any entropy extended manifold, you can express the length of the geodesic lines by n times n plus 1 over 2 uh, coefficient, n or by n times n minus 1 parameters. So in the case of a doubly extended curved surface, if it, which is 2, your n times n plus 1 over 2 is 3. So those are your three coefficients. And your n times n minus 1 over 2 is 1, which is the one parameter that you need, which is curvature. Now, in the case of a double, of a multiply extended manifold, the way Riemann, the way Riemann says you have to uh, do this is you take any point on the manifold, any point, and you, you um, uh, extend from that point an infinite number of geodesic lines in the same two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional surface. And you can measure the curvature of that surface, of that two-dimensional surface. And then you do that at every two-dimensional surface which intersects that manifold at that point. So take an example of a, of a three-dimensional curved manifold. Right, you say, how can I think of a three-dimensional curved manifold? This always get. This is where you really can find how, how ingrained Euclidean geometry is in your head. Because when you think of a two-dimensional <laughs> surface, you say, okay, this is hard enough to think about this as a, as a two-dimensional curved surface instead of a three-dimensional cantaloupe that is embedded in three-dimensional space. <laughs> but when I'm talking about a three-dimensional curved surface, you, you, you have a hard time thinking about this, right? But think about, for example, the Earth's magnetic field. It's a three-dimensional curved surface, right? That's what you're measuring. You're measuring changes in the magnetic curvature mm -hmm. in the effect of the compass needle, both in this direction, right, and as the intensity in this direction, right? Because the compass needle not only swings this way and this way, but Gauss showed it also swings that way as well. And plus, you can add other parameters, such as intensity of the magnetic field. Right? So you can get a three-dimensional surface. So in the case of a three-dimensional surface, there are actually three surfaces, three two-dimensional surfaces mm -hmm. embedded in this. This one, uh, this one, and that one. Right. So that's your n times n minus 1 over 2, which would be 3 in the case of a three-dimensional surface. Right. N times, if n is 3, then n times n minus 1 over 2 is 3. And so there are three two-dimensional surfaces that you need to measure the curvature at that point, at every point in a in a in an n-dimensional manifold. Mm -hmm. n times n minus one over two surfaces embedded in this manifold. And this is what Riemann develops in his habilitation paper in general, in his paper on he, he gives an example of it, and then later, because Riemann died, he didn't get to develop this further, but some of his followers, Levi Savita and Betty and Beltrami and these guys, mm -hmm. all developed this. Now, how do you think about this <coughs> from a... How do, you think, how, how do you think about this, the universe, in this way? 
as a, from the inside as a multi-dimensional manifold or an entropy extended manifold, curved manifold. Well, think about what what you what you think of. Forget the idea of Euclidean space. Just forget it. Okay, it doesn't exist. <coughs> what exists is a universe in which at every point in the universe, every so-called point, every universal principle is acting. Both what we call abiotic principles, life, cultural principles, all these principles are all acting at every moment, at every place in the universe. But they're acting at that moment and at that place in the universe as if they were, in effect, uh, these two-dimensional surfaces acting at each point. Is each each principle has a certain exerts a certain curvature principle of change at that point. And the as Riemann says in the habilitation paper, the colligating effect of these principles at every point is the physical measure of curvature of the universe at that point. It's not acting in the visible domain. They're acting as if they were tangent to the visible domain. Mm -hmm. You can think about this from the standpoint of Riemann's, I mean, Gal uh, Leibniz's tangents, the way the tangent plays the role in the infinitesimal calculus, or the tangent plane <coughs> in Gauss's surfaces. These principles are all acting tangent to the visible domain but they're nevertheless inside the universe itself. And so think about the universe not as a uh, Euclidean empty box in which things are happening, but as simply the, uh, the, the totality of all universal principles acting at every moment differently at each moment. Now, the key, for, the key thing about the universe as it, 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 is that, that when, this is the, the next step which take, which, where, where we have to leave the domain of Gauss and Riemann uh, per se and take it one step further is that when you're looking at the universe mm -hmm. as a whole, you ha you're investigating the principle of cognition itself. So take the example, take the case that Linus pointed to often, right, is what happens when man discovers a new universal physical principle? Does that generate a new physical principle? It doesn't generate a new physical principle because the principle was there before man discovered it. Gravitation exists, existed before Kepler discovered the principle of universal gravitation. So by discovering the principle of universal gravitation, Kepler didn't bring the principle of universal gravitation into existence. But Kepler changed the curvature of the universe because that principle of universal gravitation went into the noosphere. It became something that was being acted on by human cognition as opposed to something that was simply acting on human cognition. It became something that was acting on human cognition. And not only did it did, did human cognition act on uni on universal gravitation, but the fact that Kepler demonstrated that the mind could do that, the discovery was acting on the ability to make discoveries. Right? Because Kepler showed something about what the mind can do that everybody else had denied the mind could do. So by doing it, Kepler not only discovered a principle about the abiotic universe, he discovered something about the principle of the universe itself, of the mind. Right? So what changed? The universe itself changed because the curvature of the universe changed. And so the, 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 um, where, where the Gauss and Riemann ideas of curvature curved manifolds uh, uh, becomes um, insufficient is uh, when you uh, have when you take it into the domain of cognition it implies this right but from the standpoint of actually looking at say what the curvature of physical economic processes or the fourth domain 
that uh, you're, look, you're, we have to we have to have a concept of, of, of a curvature in which we're investigating not only the functions which measure the curvature at any moment, but the functions which measure the changing curvature, the, the way in which the curvature itself of the universe is changing. And this is just the beginning because there's a whole other side to this which has to do with the Brownian functions, but we'll have to get into that another time. Um, yeah. I'm st still not entirely sure about this n times n minus 1 over 2. Mm -hmm. Is that, that's showing you the number of, I guess, two-dimensional surfaces that you've got in your... The, yeah, the number of parameters which, which don't change. In a certain sense, what Riemann recognized from generalizing Gauss, mm -hmm. is, which, get, which is already implicit in Gauss, okay, is that you can measure, but with the, these, these functions, E, F, and G, Right. are expressed, in this case, by letters here, solely in terms of x and y. I didn't write these functions out. They're not numbers, they're functions. Yeah. Okay. So, but what that means is that, and the, the, the formula gets very complicated. Gauss's formula that he, that he writes down gets very complicated. But what it means is, is that the curvature of the surface itself defines what a geodesic is. Okay. And those from those geodesics, you can define a set of curves which, which, um, which determine position to over the surface, right? And, you own, and two sets of curves, those two sets of curves, a set of geodesics and an orthogonal set of curves are sufficient to determine position on the surface, right? And those two sets of curves will have a characteristic curvature to them, which reflects the curvature of the surface itself, right? If it's a sphere, the geodesics are going to be great circles, and the orthogonal curves are going to be small circles, right? If it's an ellipsoid, the geodesic curves would be ellipses, and the orthogonal curves will also be ellipses. Okay. So the curvature of the surface itself is expressed in the way those two curves are changing, right? Mm -hmm. So in effect, you can, the, the curvature is reflected in the changing measure of lengths of geodesics as you move around the surface. All right, so what, what, uh, um, so one, so the, with, given it, it, it's a two-dimensional surface, what Gauss shows, first of all, is that you can, with these three functions, E, F, and G, you can find the expression of the curvature as it reflects itself in these three functions. Mm -hmm. But also, the curvature itself the w is the one parameter which in effect determines these three functions. Okay, there's one parameter. Now, in the case, and that, that, that Think of curvature not as a number. In the case of the sphere, the curvature is always one, or one over the square of the radius, right? But in the case of this, that, that curvature is, a, is, a, is not a number, but a function, right? In the case of something complicated like this. Okay, now, the, um, uh, okay, so that's the relationship, right? You take, in, the, you need th in, a, in a double extended manifold, you, you can express the curvature as it affects changing lengths. You need these three coefficients. And, but there's one, one parameter which is actually determining what those three coefficients are. And that's your n plus, n times n plus one over two and n times n minus one over two that Riemann has in the hidden notation. So in the case of a double extent of a triple extended surface, you, Riemann says, well, you have in order to measure the curvature at every point, in order to measure in a triply extended surface, then to measure your position, your your geodesic length will have not not two parameters but three. Okay, so in this case you would have x, y, and z, right? Okay. And in order to 
write a function for length with three parameters, you need um, uh, uh, six coefficients. Okay? But you can then measure the curvature by three tangent the curvature at each point of, three, of, of how the curvature is changing in three different directions. <coughs> That's where the n times n plus 1 over 2 and n times n minus 1 over 2. And that's what Riemann's talking about there. So what Ga it's already implicit in Gauss because what Gauss does is he says you can, met you can find the curvature from these three coefficients and then he says but you can also find it in a simpler way. Right by the by the uh, triangles, but the basic point is that the relationship between the one measure curvature, the one function that measures the curvature, is also also de determines the length of the geodesic line. But the relationship requires three coefficients to express. So what you see is that we're, we, the the interesting thing here, and the thing to play around to really get to know is that what Riemann and Gauss are both looking at, and again, as I said, is how do you actually know something from the inside? Because that's what science comes from. Science is how do you figure out uh, how the universe is acting while you're in the universe? You're not outside the universe. And the, 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 the crime of Euclid and the crime of Aristotle is to say, we are. Our minds are outside the universe. <laughs> because how do you how do you measure the universe when you're in it? And so Gauss's method is what what what, what, what Gauss and Riemann's method on curvature does is it is it is it takes us from just simply stating we're in the universe to actually getting to know the universe. Yeah, Mike. Um, you're saying that. Uh, in taking something like Kepler or Gauss, that uh, solving a practical problem, you, you solve the practical problem by demonstrating the universal principle. As you said, Kepler was uh, demonstrating a principle, but he just happened to take the uh, solar system as a whole. Or Gauss right. took up. Uh, well, he didn't just happen to. He was he was drawn to it because that's the problem that had to be. He, he, he says, why does it look at Lynn on the question of physical economy? Yeah, that actually brings me to my question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and Gauss taking, uh, you know, he happened to take ge geodesy or, uh, and magnetism to, you know, demonstrate the principle you're talking about. Yeah, right. Now, extending that to Lynn um, in what he's looking at right now, which, what problems that he's trying to solve with the animations, um, well, these guys didn't, like I I was thinking these guys didn't just take any random project. They obviously right. particular problems um, that were in the con in the context of a whole history discovery. So when we're looking at to say what we're trying to demonstrate um, with the animations project, um, like how Gauss and these guys chose to take take these particular physical experiments to demonstrate the principle. I guess. Uh, in what we're looking at, which which physical experiments we're now doing with physical economy, uh, how do you choose the ones that are going to be able to demonstrate the the, the, uh, the physical principle Lin's looking at? Um, well, Lin said uh, yeah. uh, already started that right with what you're looking at. You're looking at the, I mean, he's in his new paper as well as in the animations paper and the travel among cities and all these other things. You've got to look at the, 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 you know, what you're looking at fundamentally is the is the effect of the human mind on the physical universe, and how that changes the human mind. So you can't measure that directly any more than if you're on the surface, you can't see the the, the whole surface. You can't see the curvature. What you what Gauss means by curvature is the effect of the principle on your measurements. So you can't point to the measurement. You can't, the, the measurement, as he says in his latest paper, the formula is the footprint of the principle. 
So how did you know that the planets are moving in non-uniform orbits? You don't actually see the non-uniform motion. You, the non-uniform motion is expressed in your measurements by the change, the way your measurements are changing. So, as he pointed out yesterday, or uh, that this question of animations, you want to show in your animations the effect of the uh, addition or subtraction of a principle in the economic process. So that's really, that's hard to design. That's what has to be designed. And, and the, you know, that's the, that takes, that's science. <laughs> that's what the new astronomy is. Kepler was trying to show the effect of gravitation. Because remember that, that the Ptolemy and Copernicus and Tycho Brahe didn't, didn't even speculate as to what the cause of the movement of the planet was. They were just trying to describe the motion. So Kepler was doing some inverse. He was saying, okay, this motion that we're measuring is the effect of a principle. What's the principle? Well, the, you don't see the principle. But he says, he, but the, 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 the scientific method is to say, the, what you, uh, Kepler was to demonstrate that the effect that you're seeing is the effect of a principle. What you're seeing is the effect, the me, what you're measuring is the effect of a principle. Not simply just uh, sensory appearance. So we're seeing economic effects, right? You're seeing increases and decreases in, in economic potential. You can't see economic potential. Right? How do you actually measure changes, increases, or decreases in economic potential? That's what our animations have to be designed to do. That's what you're trying to measure. So Lynn is already that the problem. Lynn, Lynn is Lynn has already solved the problem. The question of the animations is simply to uh, demonstrate, further elaborate and demonstrate the, the solution which has already been done. The problem's already been solved. It's not. It's not like we have this part. This problem has been fundamentally solved. There are lots of problems that haven't been fundamentally solved, but the but the uh, but this relationship has been. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what Juan asked, but I thought it was a pretty good question on how do you measure the area? Uh, because if the, if the simple way of measuring the curvature instead was taking the ratio of the uh, defect or excess over the area, it seems like it, we could assume what if the area, if it were just a flat plane, you know how to measure that area. But, and then we could know, we know how to measure. Yeah, well, it, it seems like you would have to already presuppose what the rate of the, what the, how much this curve is well, in order to figure it out. Like, well, the simplest way to do it is to map it onto a sphere, and then you map, and then you can measure the area there. In other words, you map the curved area onto the spherical. You make a Gauss map. And you ma make the curved area on, you map the area of the triangle, of the curved surface, using a Gauss map onto a sphere, and then you measure simply the portion of the sphere. Because the spherical triangles are the easiest ones. You know, if you look at Gauss's um, works on geodesy, you see how he does this. You're measuring areas on a curved surface on the on the uh, spheroidal surface of the Earth, and then you map those onto a spherical surface, and then you map the spherical, then you measure the spherical surface. It's a very similar to what Kepler does with the elliptical orbit, because he maps the elliptical motion onto a circular, non-uniform circular motion, and then measures the circular area swept out, which is not the elliptical area, but it's proportional. Yeah, Bruce. Um, 
It seems like, well, with the science, uh, I don't understand a lot of specifics, but I can understand the more perceptual things. It seems like, you know, um, you can understand this. So it's not beyond me now. Right. But it's this one, I guess it's a conceptual question, more so. It's the idea, right? Like you just said at the beginning, people think outside of the universe, right? Meaning that there are certain principles that, that act in the universe that a person just cannot break, right? Martin Luther King said the long curve of justice or the universe bent towards justice, right? right. So now I get to this point where, you know, I look at more, um, like for instance, Lynn with his economics. These are scientific things, but they're actually quite social. Actually, they're like the highest level of ideas with humanity, right? That deal with like almost every mm -hmm. aspect of humanity, especially right. social. Mm -hmm. The economic science, the mm -hmm. science, it seems like this. But how do you take from curvature, right, from all of these things that seem to be abstract when you apply them to economics or seem to be abstract when you apply them to justice? How would you take an idea like, let's say, justice or, or some social idea like that and from science see that? Oh wow! This is what justice is from a curve, right? Well, that's why. <laughs> no, I mean that's what it was seem like, right? No, no, but that's that's. It, I'm sorry, it was silly. No, no, no. That's why. That, but that's why you. It's not just science. It's science and art, and that's where the music comes in. First of all, you'll get a better you get a better sense of how this works, as you said. You, you now now you're beginning to recognize that this is a concept you can get. And now you have to work on it. Because the more you work on it, work on the problem. And like you take certain certain of these projects that Lynn's outlined, like the fundamental theorem of algebra, the uh, catenary principle, the doubling of the square, a cube, doubling the square and the cube, right? You take these these the Kepler problem and you take these scientific problems. And now that you 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 got a certain confidence that these are conceptual problems that you can get, and you start to work them through in detail. You'll you'll answer your own question. At the, if at the same time you do that, you work on the music, because there's two sides to this thing. The one is the the, the investigating the science, which is an investigation really of the way the mind investigates the universe outside of it. And the second is art, which is most condensed in music, which is the way in which the mind investigates the way the mind investigates. And the way the mind, and, and choral music is you see how the social process works. And you can't get that idea by just talking about it, but you get it when you actually sing in the chorus. Because when you sing in the chorus, not just the first time, I mean, it's one thing to sing in the chorus the first time. You say, hey, this is a lot of fun. I get it. I see we're all singing together. But then when you actually start to work it through, right, and you get to the point where you can really make something like the Jesu Minor Freud totally transparent, and you know you've made it totally transparent in a choral work, which is very rare. You know, most choruses, most of the time, don't do it. But if it happens, right, and the people and people hear it, the people who did it and the people who hear it will never forget it. It's not something that happens that right? But once you get to that point and you see what, what you were able to do, then you know something in a much richer way than you than you know, say, theoretically that it can be done. Because you've actually done it. And and the more you do that, this is what education really is about. Because if you were if this is what your education had been then you reach the age of, of adulthood where you have a real sense of confidence that you know what the mind can do and you spend the rest of your life developing it. Right? So we're, we have to accelerate that process. Right? And hopefully we make, and, and also create the conditions by which the next generation coming up gets this even at earlier ages. Right? And that's how it works. That's how you get the sense of that question. You answer it for yourself but you only, but at, and the more you, the more you, now, now that you've made the first step, which is to recognize that you're, that this is something you can know. That's the first step. And the second step is where you actually start to get to know it, and that requires actually doing it, and also teaching it, 
teaching it to somebody else who knows less than you. And that's when you really start to learn it. And that's how it works. And you never stop doing it. And, you know, you go back to something like the curved surfaces paper, you know, which you, you work on. 35 years from now, you'll come back at it again and see something totally new in it. Because you get always an enriched understanding of it because your mind gets better. The more you teach, the more you develop, the more you work on these things, the more you get experience. And that's why Kepler, you know, when he wrote the Mysterium Cosmographicum and they republished it 25 years later, he said, I'm not going to change a word of it because I come back to the same subject again and I see that the, the, the seed of everything I've done is is in here, even though most of, a lot of what I've said in there is I now know better. So that's how you can answer that question for yourself. Yeah. Inside? inside yeah, chamber. that's why what Gauss does is exactly what Leibniz does with the infinitesimal, yeah. right? And what you're measuring is the the, re the the increase and decrease, the ratio of the curvature to the excess or defect, at, as it changes from moment to moment around the surface. So that there's not a single ratio. Yeah, it's true. For this, if you measure a large area, then, then you're, get, you're not getting the true measure of all the, you're getting, in a sense, the average curvature over this point. So to measure the total curvature of the surface, you have to m measure this relationship at every single point along the surface. Well, it's easier in principle. <laughs> I mean, this is what Riemann talks about in his in, in his um, in his uh, habilitation paper, the difference between surfaces of constant curvature, manifolds of constant curvature, and manifolds of non-constant curvature. And it's obviously easier if it's constant curvature because then what you measure at a single point is uniform throughout the surface. But with surfaces of non-constant curvature, it gets more complicated and you have to look for higher principles. So then you, then you have to look for, and, and, in, and in principle, things get extremely complicated and you can't, you can't measure it, you can't actually come up with a measure of the total curvature by measuring at every point. So what you have to look for are, are the global effects which actually determine the change in curvature at every point. Well, that's where you get into this question of the <coughs> functions in hypergeometry. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's what that's that's what that's what we, that's the other side of it. The other side of it is to look for what what are what are sometimes called what, what Riemann called analysis cetus. Those global characteristics, which the variations in curvature don't make any changes. Like what, what, what is, what is, what doesn't change from a sphere to an ellipsoid to a, right, to a something that, to this watermelon or this cantaloupe, versus a, say a torus. Yeah, which has a different, has different things about it, right? I don't think I have the I don't have the images here. But for example, if you if you take if you take this the, this and you make the map of the of this cantaloupe onto the uh, Gauss sphere, it'll cover the sphere exactly once. But if you map the torus 
onto the sphere. It'll cover the sphere twice. In two different, it'll, the first layer will cover the sphere in one direction, and the second layer will cover the sphere in the other direction. So, so the so now you get into that kind of changes, right? From a doubly, a double, doubly connected, simply connected to doubly connected, and that shows up in this question of curvature as well. So these these questions of curvature are connected to the other question that Riemann is dealing with on this question of what are sometimes called topological or analysis sedis questions. And, and that's really what you're looking at, is the, the two things, right? Yeah. I have two questions. One, what does that have to do with what you just said about the pillars with mapping infolded surfaces on sphere? Right, the, the kind of stuff that um, the animation you have, where right. everything's crazy. Um, and the second, <laughs> the, sec the second question was, um, I was trying to think about, like, I mean, is it, is it, is it mostly for, con for conceptual, like reasons that uh, Riemann takes this thing that Gauss did? We're looking at um, like the, the changes, the changes of a, of a principle in respect to a, a manifold like, versus like a particular surface. Like, like, as you said, Gauss takes, trying to find the curvature of a, a certain kind of surface, so he just looks at, for example, the changes of this, uh, of the triangle. Uh, first of what Riemann does is he's looking at uh, the, the changes of, of a principle itself and how that determines a, uh, a, a manifold. Is that... Is that well, that? yeah, but think about, uh, in other words, we, we take the Gauss idea of surfaces, to be sort of a, as Riemann did, a sort of a, 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 a pedagogical uh, um, ex example of physical process. And in this case, what Gauss does with the curved surfaces is what, as what Riemann calls an investigation of these characteristics of it with respect to a double extended manifold. And then Riemann says you can extend it to triply extended and entiply extended manifolds, right? Now the extensions, so-called dimensions, are not additional numbers, but they're principles which are acting on the manifold, on your physical action. At every place. At every place, right. Yeah. So the number of ways in which the principle, or in the case, say, of magnetism, the way the magnetism is varying differently over from uh, with, with respect to position or time, because that's another aspect of the Earth's magnetic field. It's actually changing. It's getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, and at some point it's going to it's going to get to zero and then start reversing polarity, where the where our compasses will point south. Yeah, it happened before. <laughs> there's a lot of this you know the, this is a, a whole area that that is interesting to study is the relationship of the of mag the earth's magnetism also to living processes living processes are very sensitive to magnetic effects what about the uh, the crazy Riemannians in 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 folded mass on the sphere well, but that that's that that comes into play when you get into these things like the mapping of the torus to the sphere, to the Gauss map of the torus, where it, it makes a double a double covering of the sphere. So it's that that's a Riemann surface. So these the the relationships to this of these questions of curvature to those other types of maps comes out in that way. Are you looking at how the how the how those manifolds intersect to determine the, like the, 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 the there's another there's another characteristic other than just curvature, which is the number of singularities in the manifold. And when you have more singularities in the manifold, such as in a torus, which has two degrees of freedom as opposed to a sphere, a, 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 a simple extended surface. If I, if I draw any curve on this surface, 
it makes an inside and an outside. It divides the surface into two parts. Whereas with a torus, I can divide a torus, I can draw curves I can on a torus, which don't divide it into two parts. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that so the point is is that it's not the particular curve that I draw that's important. It's the fact that I can do it. So the manifolds that whose curvature and whose characteristic of action can, are, can be expressed by things like a torus are manifolds that have a, a greater density of singularity. And that's where the two come together. Riemann brought the two together. He never quite completed sort of pulling the two together, but he, he developed these two areas of thought. Right, the multiply dimensional manifold and this whole question of abelian functions. And in his habilitation paper, he refers in the beginning how these are connected, where he talks about multiply extended continuous manifolds. And he says these come, come out not in the domain of common experience, but only in these things like abelian functions. So he had in his mind how these things were connected. But they weren't, they were brought together later really by the work of Möbius and Listine and Beltrami and Betty and Levi Savit and Ricci and all these guys who continue to do work on development. So we can reconstruct what Riemann had in mind just from Riemann. I mean you can see it, you can you can see how it how these others developed it, which gives you a little bit of insight because they were a little closer to Riemann and so you can sort of see how the thought was coming about, you know, how their thought was working. But when you go back and you can find it all directly in Riemann, and that's the thing to do. There's a section in uh, in Defense of Common Sense, I think it's chapter 10, where Lin is talking about curvature with respect to an economy. And he, he well, he talks about it in a way that seemed very different than the way that I've seen Gauss and Riemann talk about. He says that in an economy you're looking at uh, entropic versus anti-entropic curvatures of the process. Right. I, I just wanted to... Well, because what you're looking at is not just a curvature, but you're looking at a changing curvature. So the question is, in an economy you're looking at a changing curvature which increases the density of singularities in the manifold. So that's anti entropy That's a higher concept. You're right. It is a higher concept of curvature than what's in Riemann or, or Gauss, but it's implicit in Riemann and Gauss. In other words, what you're looking at is, in a sense, if you think of curvature as being a, 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 a really a dynamic, what Lynn is talking about with anti-entropic in an economy is that you have a dynamic in which the dynamic changes because that's what an that's what that's why that's 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 what's unique about an economic process is it's a it because it involves not just abiotic processes but also biotic and cognitive. So what you're changing is the potential of the economy, right? So. Um, and you're changing your you're, you're changing your potential is is itself always changing. So you get a change in the curvature, which is not a simple change in curvature from more curved to less curved, or positive to negative curvature, but a change more like a change in the from one species of abelian functions to another. That's the kind of change you're talking about, right? <laughs> Which expresses itself as a change in curvature, right? But it's not it's not like, you know, this part of the surface is more curved and this part is less curved. There's only so much you can do to, to this type of surface, right? You can make it more curved or less curved. You can make you can make mountains, you know, you can make all kinds of hills and valleys on it. But, you know, it's you're only making it more curved, less curved, positive or negative, right? Like if I could make this, if I could 
you know, sort of indent this into a into a concave area here, then it would bulge out over here, right? But so that doesn't fundamentally change it. The characteristic curvature doesn't fundamentally change by increasing or decreasing the variation of curvature on a doubly extended manifold, right? Or a triply extended manifold. But it does, but if I change this from a torus to a, from, from this type of surface to a torus, <coughs> then I have a curvature which is both positive and negative. Right? So it's, it's, um, it's, uh, you get a different, a different type. So that's what you're really talking about, is it? A curvature of changing curvatures. It's a more, you're right, it's a more, it's a more advanced, complex concept of curvature. But the, the, you, for, for these kinds of concepts, as with the Gauss, you have to get away from the idea that curvature means not straight. That curvature means change. And so you're measuring the type of change, the characteristic of change. So, Curvature is just simply a, an intuitive way to sort of get a, a better sense of this idea of change, of what we mean by change. Right? And then when you get that, you say, well, how many, how much, how, how can I, how can this, what are the, what are the maximum types of changes that can occur? And there's a, there's a, there's a certain boundary to that change, just like with the doubling of the square. I can double the square, triple the square, quadruple the square. I can change the square an infinite number of ways, right? But I, I, there's nothing I can do by changing the square which is going to change the cube, right? So now you've got the change within the square and the change within the cube, but then you have the change from the square to the cube, and that's a discontinuous change, right? There's, you, can, you can change the, the square continuously, and you can change the cube continuously, but you can't change from the square to the cube continuously, right? You've added a new principle and everything's changed. All the relationships have changed. The whole principle on which things are related to each other has changed. That's another example of changing, that kind of changing curvature. But there you're dealing with all straight lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we gotta stop. Yeah, we gotta stop so that people can get out of here before they get eaten by bugs. Yeah. Real quick, I didn't really. I'm trying to conceptualize this question of the, the intersecting. Because I thought of Kuza when you brought it up. Yeah. Like looking at the manifold as yeah. all the possibilities of action. And what separates man, one manifold from the other is, is um, like what you said, the ability to determine right. the, 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 the curvature. The curvature of it. Right. Like that. And so. I was I was thinking about Michael's question on, on economics, right? Because in mean, economics, you have <laughs> uncountable manifolds. Yeah. So, like, how do you begin? I guess it's a redundant question, but you know, from this standpoint, how do you begin to uh, me measure the kinds of manifolds that are interacting to create certain effects? Because, because aren't all of them interacting at once? But then, now how do you isolate? Well, that, that's the point. That, that's, you, you start with the things that are, you can't measure them all at once. Yeah. Right? So you look at things like with this, with the next one. You look, you look, you look, you look, at, you, you look at the kind of things. Hey, Michelle, how are you doing? You, kind of, you look at things like, like what Lynn is talking about, say transportation, uh, water, you know, transportation, water, transportation with them, water for, for uh, industrial and drinking purposes. Power. Yeah, I did. 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 Yeah
that kind of thing. So you have to you, you, you look at them and then you look at then you look at them all together, right? And then you form, you can only look at them all together in the mind. The mind can do things that mathematics can't express. Don't worry about the, look. Take if Brunelleschi had not built the dome using the catenary principle, nobody would have ever. Leibniz would not have been led to discover the catenary principle, but Brunelleschi didn't know what Leibniz knew about the catenary principle. Right? So the mind can recognize the physical principle and actually harness it before it can express it, even, even express it in how the principle uh, works, uh, say, with a mathematical expression. Now, once Leibniz made the, made the discovery, now we know a whole lot more about the catenary than Brunelleschi knew. Mm -hmm. Let's take, take nuclear power. We really don't know. You can have your own We don't know anything about nuclear. We really don't know much about the nucleus. But we, but we, because, we, and that's 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 the schizophrenic part. Well, like somebody asked me earlier, that well, my my uncle is a nuclear engineer and he does all the stuff with nuclear energy, but he believes in quantum physics. But he doesn't use quantum physics for his nuclear engineering. He uses experimental. Experimental engineering, you know, that you can do experiments and you learn your mind recognizes how principles work, even though you can't express them mathematically. And that's why what happens when you get these um, you know, these young engineers used to have it doesn't have now it's worse, but it used to happen that the young engineers would come out of out of engineering school with their slide rules and they would be working out the formulas. And then at the end, of, and then and then they wouldn't work. And the old guy who had been working, who knew how to build planes, you know, who had the experience, says, "Let me tell you something. You know, forget that formula. Forget that formula. Forget that formula. Because here's what you have to do to build the plane." <laughs> right. So the mind can actually know principles really well, even if you can't write a mathematical expression for it. And then every once in a while, somebody comes along <laughs> and benefits from the knowledge we have about the principle, and you get this question of, of what um, what Leibniz discovered about the catenary, which demonstrates why the thing worked with Brunelleschi. Look, take the thing with the American system, like Lynn says about economics, okay? Hamilton understood something about economics, right? Franklin understood something about economics. And they understood something about economics because they understood and they made it work. And Lincoln understood this, right? And they were able to make it work because they understood a principle of economics. Because the mind grasps this principle of the relationship of the power of the mind and the physical universe, right? But they were not aware, by any stretch of the imagination, of the underlying principles of why the American system works. In other words, they knew some things about why it worked, but they didn't know what Lynn knows about why it worked. Remember, Lynn said in, in one of the recent papers, he said, he said, we have to practice the American system of economics on a level of understanding of the principles much greater than even the greatest proponents of it have ever known. Just thinking about right? Yeah. That's the beginning of the power statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the principle of powers, right. Yeah. So that's 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 the way it works, right? In other words, you don't say, you don't know because I don't have a mathematical expression for it, and then you I don't know the principle. Well, no, I think what you said, because I just, what, what you just said something made me think about, because what you're, what you're doing is you're taking, I mean, small, <laughs> very small uh, sort of investigations, right? This agriculture in respect to the universe, right, in a, in a certain nation or something like that. It's a very small measurement if you're trying to get a universal characteristic, right? But it's the same, it's the same problem with the catenary, right? But the, I was just thinking about the challenge of, of taking these types of uh, investigations in, in the small, but then each one of those then interacting, yeah. try, just trying to conceptualize the implications of, of that kind of thing. Well, you find certain anomalies, right, that poke out at you and say, hey, there's a new principle here. <laughs> like the elliptical function. Okay. Right? You Gauss could measure the elliptical orbit to any degree of precision you wanted. 
but he said, I don't know the principle. There's an underlying principle. That's all I can do is approximate. I try and measure elliptical motion by circular functions. You can't see the principle. The principle is somewhere underneath. You can't you couldn't see the principle until you get the complex domain. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I got work to do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You got work to do. So you guys are going up to Montreal? Right. I don't know. We got to figure it out. I'm going. Well, you should go too. <laughs> yeah, the only question is if all if all three of us are going to go. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, we gotta, we gotta finish. But, uh, sure. well, you gotta, you gotta get out of here. Okay. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, is the, is the, uh, relationship between the similarities and the, the area of curvature always one to, always one? I'll find out tomorrow. I just have an idea. Well, just a second. I, I, when I talked to Lynn before, he, I said we'll start Monday, but I just wanted to confirm. Okay. Okay. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, is the relationship to the, uh, the amount of singularities to the area of curvature always one to one like the torus? I mean, in the torus, when you map the torus on, you get this, you get the cross section of the poles, right? Yeah. On the two poles. Yeah. You're saying in the areas you can double. Yeah. So it always is the singularity relation between the. Yeah. It's always the same. So, that's interesting. You were saying that there is curvature <laughs> and also the right in, the, in these uh, higher manifolds. Right. The other thing you mentioned, you said that the inclination, declination, and the terrestrial is completely extended. Manifold. Yeah, yeah. But Gauss is varies this way and it varies this way. But Gauss and his equilibrium equations trying to isolate the terrestrial manifold, right? He's not looking at the inclination, declination, and the paper. Well, he does several things in the, in the, in the theory of Earth, general theory of Earth magnitude. Yeah, that one th thing you're talking about. Because no, he has hit. But th that's just this. But, but no, but in the in the general theory of Earth magnitude, you're looking at something. You're looking. No, at it's the one that change in omega as you change is equal yeah. to the origin right. the, 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 between the elements and right. then the terrestrial magnitude right. makes us three. Right. Right. I'm saying, see, I thought he was trying to isolate. Right, but look in the, look, yeah, he is. But look in the, in the, the, the longer paper he wrote, the general theory of Earth's magnitude. The Toronto only translated at the beginning of the He got really excited about it. But look at that one. And Where he talks about all the different, oh, really? he doesn't develop it before, like, right? First, we got to get the first one. Yeah. Well, you should you should get some people together and work on the curved surface. Yeah. That's what I recommend. Sort of. And you know, I did some pedagogies on this back. I can't remember when, but there's some in there, and I'm going to write another one. Okay. So that I'll take you started. I worked through the layman on mine. Oh yeah. So it's because I've seen two around this animation project. Yeah. When you have essentially there's a magnitude that's surprising the dynamic of the economy. Except for these that explain the lens in the first part of the independent conversation about the value parameters of automatic or increasing relative to the population. And so in our mind, he goes into this whole thing about the yeah. mind and yeah. the components that mm -hmm. compromise it yeah. and the mind that created the right. universe. He says it's really fascinating. He says that in the domain of the senses, our, our perception is continuous in spirit. Mm -hmm. And then he says, in a reason, it's discrete. And then I was thinking about that in conjunction with what you said about how our mind well, is such a child side. What you mean by discrete, what you mean by discrete is discovery. Singularity. Yeah. 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 Because, <laughs> you know, a discovery is a 
you know, the unique secret of the singularity, right? Yeah. 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 The Dunwoody yeah. Square, yeah. you got all the information and you know, it's discovered, you got something yeah. much older. It's a new discovery. Yeah. Also, yeah. Yeah. But then I was thinking yeah. too about the yeah. report yeah. paper, yeah. when Riemann says that objects are senses and yeah. colors, yeah. Yeah. continuous. Yeah. And what I was thinking about objects of sense, and four, well, no, he means the position of object of sense. The object of sense are discrete. And that could include smell. Yeah, sure. That could include. Well, but the, the object of the, yeah, yeah, but 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 what he he's talking about the positions of object of space are is a continuous manifold. I mean, the colors is another doubly thing. It seems like Kruger thinks that that. But the difference between the objects. Yeah. And, the, and the perceptions themselves. Like you see a continuum of colors, but you don't see a continuum of color things. I know what I'm saying. You see chairs. I'm sure I pass over here. You know, you don't see color except on except colored things. The, the other part that he, that he really incorporates in there 